All right, this is Art 131 with Wynnum Graves. We're going to be talking about brewing today with Clark Danderson and Bo Henderson. Um, Clark, if you'd introduce yourself and give us a little background on you, and then Bo, if you'd do the same. All right. Well, I'm, I'm Clark. Um, I'm actually, I teach over at um, Auburn University at Montgomery. Uh, I do microbiology there. And I'm currently uh, in charge of the fermentation program. And so I'm creating a bunch of different courses that uh, relate to brewing beer and the fermentation process. Um, also during this time, I'm taking the certificate, uh, the brewing certificate that um, Auburn does as a graduate certificate. Um, and, you know, I, I'm very active in the brewing community. All right, excellent. And Bo? Yeah, my name is Bo Henderson. Uh, I am the owner of Henderson Homebrew. It is the local homebrew shop here in Montgomery. I've uh, been brewing for a while. Um, and that's and I've also worked in the brewing industry. I worked at a cidery. I've worked for a mobile beer canning company. Um, so I've got a fair amount of experience in both the homebrew world and the professional brewing world. Oh, well, that's, that's excellent. It sounds like we have a lot of the, the science end of it and a lot of the um, uh, where the rubber meets the road. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, uh, Clark, if you'd give us just a short history of... Um, actually, before we do that, let, let, let's do the, the, the types of fermented drinks that, that we have. Um, mm -hmm. I know that beer and wine have technical differences, but then there's things that are like mead and cider that I know also have specific definitions and if, if mm -hmm. whichever one of you wants to go through that is fine by me well you, you know when, when we look at wine uh, really wine is using uh, yeast uh, a lot of times those yeasts come from the grapes themselves uh, so if you think of the grapes growing out there on the vine uh, their surface has yeast on them and a lot of times they use those natural yeast to do the fermentation although there are wine yeasts that can be used that are uh, members of the same sort of brewer yeast um, group mm -hmm. um, when we think of wine, we typically think of, you know, a alcoholic beverage that's being produced by fruit. Typically, it's grapes, but there are other types of wines. You can make it with apple, um, you know, melon. Absolutely. Any, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, pretty much anything, any wine made in the state of Alabama is going to be fruit wine, uh, not grapes. Uh, they run sweeter. Alabama's not the best grape growing environment. No. Nope. Uh, yeah, I can imagine. <laughs> and, well, the grape, the grapes you get will be very because it's so hot. They've got to, they're just gonna have so much sugar in them that you're. It's hard to make dry wine in Alabama. How about that? Yep. <laughs> yeah. There we go. <laughs> yeah, the, the wines are gonna be sugar bombs. Yeah. 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 Um, um, and then, so what defines be beer tasty. separately? Well, Say again. Yeah. Beer is well, made with grain. Yeah. Uh, first of all. Uh, barley. And so, uh, and then it is uh, bold and uh, to remove the sugar from the grain, mm -hmm. as opposed to just mashing the grain up to get to the sugar. You're actually going to make sugar water from uh, boiling the grain for as long as you can to get it all out. Okay. Yeah. So when we think of beer, what Bo's talking about is, is malt. Yeah. Uh, malted barley. And so that's yes. essential to the brewing process. Okay. Um, all the enzymes necessary to do the conversion are, are contained within the grain themselves. Um, so it's it's like you're almost doing when when you think of malting, it's like a mini germination followed by a quick cook, mm -hmm. and then mm -hmm. you know some of those sugars have been partially digested. The enzymes have been woken up, and then as everything is kind of dried out and kilned, uh, they kind of go dormant. And mm -hmm. then in the brewing process, we want to wake those enzymes up so they can start breaking down those sugars further. And then that creates the fermentable wort, which is then what the yeast will, will consume. And let's actually, let's go back just a little bit mm -hmm. because I'm not sure. I mean, let's talk about how you make alcohol, period. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, let, some people, some people may, I mean, will this, would these people class know? Um, no, but let's, let, let's do the, let's do the last few definitions of, okay, of what we're sure. talking about and then we'll get into the history of fermentation. I think that sure. that, that would be a better place to start with how sure. it's made at all. Well, um, sure. so are there any other, are, are beer and wine kind of enough to, to cover the gamut or? Well, I mean, you could think of cider, uh, cider mm -hmm. essentially it's the type of wine, uh, okay. specifically mm -hmm. just apples. So it is uh, apples or pears. Okay. Apples yeah. or pears. Um, and, and there are um, combinations of things. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, and there are, there are all kinds of different things. If it's a grain, a lot of times you can ferment it. If it's a fruit, you can ferment it. Um, 
There's mead that's made with honey, and it's yep. essentially a wine. Um, yep. Okay. So essentially, so. our big split is wine is fruit, beer mm-hmm. is grain, and mm-hmm. everything else is something inside one of those two categories? By and large. I would yep. say that's fair. Yeah. Okay. All right, cool. Then I think that's a good definition to kind of take us through the rest of this conversation today. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And, Bo, you are correct. Most of these students are not going to know how alcohol is made in general. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think a lot of the people listening have some idea, but not um, a end-to-end uh, right. view on it. So if you want to walk us through that, that would be great. Yeah, I mean, fermentation is uh, it's just essentially the conversion of sugar uh, into uh, carbon dioxide and into alcohol. Uh, I know Clark could probably speak way, way more uh, intelligently about what is happening in the actual fermentation, but all that's really happening, I mean, on its most basic level, though, yeast is eating sugar, it's burping off CO2 and leaving alcohol. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, um, I mean, yeah. We, we can think of fermentation as being like a, a survival strategy for for yeast and other mm. organisms, microbes. Um, okay, go ahead and explain that. So when, when we think of yeast, yeast actually prefer to live in an environment that's oxygen rich mm-hmm. and just like we do. And when they are living in that kind of environment, they do a normal type of cellular respiration. Uh, that's basically the process that makes cellular energy for them, just like we do. Mm-hmm. Um, however, when we do brewing, a lot of times what we want to do is we kind of stress the yeast out. And we do this by preventing more oxygen from getting into the system. Mm -hmm. So we create this sort of closed system. Um, Oxygen is used up by the yeast. And then once it's used up and they don't have any more oxygen coming in, um, a lot of times what you'll see is they'll start really picking up their fermentation process. And that's a Mm -hmm. survival process. Um, So they're bringing down the the water to get to the oxygen. The use as a survival process is because it's just it produces much less energy. So are they breaking down um, sugar to get to that oxygen, or what are they yep, doing? They're yeah. breaking down sugar. Well, so for example, when you think of you know normal cellular respiration, they're breaking down sugar too. Mm-hmm. But that normal sugar that they're breaking down makes a lot more energy because of oxygen. Mm. Right. It, it not. I don't want to go into too much detail, but oxygen is important because it is an electron acceptor, yeah. and it's at the very end stage of the process. Um, if you don't have that electron acceptor, then that cellular respiration that produces the bulk of the energy mm-hmm. can't occur. Okay, that makes sense. And so uh, fermentation occurs. And okay. fermentation produces like way less energy. Yeah. And so it's a survival strategy. Oh, that's interesting. Mm-hmm. I didn't realize it was a secondary process. I always thought it was yep. the... the no. Well, primary. and you know, the, the thing with fermentation is it can it can occur at the same time that cells are respiring, but mm-hmm. it's it's an inefficient process for them. Yeah, uh, you imagine. got to think of CO two as being a waste product, and ethanol is a waste product. Mm-hmm. Okay, and it's yeah. actually toxic for these for the organisms. Yeah, um, I know mm-hmm. that at a certain point they'll die. Yeah. Um, okay. Well, while we're on yeah, that, so the yeast is the yeast is like uh, we don't have any more oxygen. Let's start eating this sugar. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, and so it starts eating that sugar, and then and that, I'm sure on the very cellular level, it's sort of like, well, look, we're going to get some more oxygen, but let's just eat this now. Yeah. Uh, even though our, you know, it produces something toxic for us, but then we just know we just never allow the yeast to, you know, get more oxygen. Yeah. Yeah. So. Um, okay. Uh, so we have these little creatures that live inside our sugary water mixture. Um, right. They're making alcohol for us because we're mm-hmm. stressing them out, um, or we're not providing them with oxygen, and. Mm-hmm. Um, are these, is this one species of yeast? Is this a bunch of creatures? Is this within how how wide of a how wide of a range of little creatures are we talking about? Are these well, like within the range of, of domesticated dogs? Or are these within the range of like it, it's all like domesticated birds? dogs? Okay, so it's all one species for the most part. Um, it's Saccharomyces cerevisiae or Brewer's. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's the same yeast you use to make bread. Okay, um, it's the same yeast that's used to make wine, cider, mead. Um, it's all the same. It's the same species. However, those species have tons and tons of strains. And we could think of strains as being kind of like, yeah, the different breeds of dogs. Okay. And just like different breeds of dogs, some of them perform at different tasks better than others. Okay. 
yeah, yeah. That, that's awesome um and i so i assume that there are some that are better for for beer and some that are better mm-hmm. for wine yeah. and some that absolutely are better for mead. yeah mm-hmm. you could some... I mean, you could make beer with with the yeast that you use to make bread but it would be a gross yeasty beer oh it would just <laughs> taste funky uh, okay yeah it's it would taste, taste it would taste odd it's but you taste it. very bready yeah but yeah. like yeah there are there are yeasts that leave lots of flavor behind or leave sort of fruity flavors in whatever you're making there are yeasts that are just leave absolutely no flavor behind whatsoever and all you get is whatever you uh ferment started with, with whatever yeah. whatever you started with exactly so that's yeah it's it yeah. that's a very good way to put dogs is a good analogy okay cool and yeah it, i'm uh, glad that analogy yeah and there, and there are to be to be clear there are some other species um of yeast too mm. um so if we think of it they're different they're Two main. If, if we look at uh, like the main brewing yeast, we have two main types. We have okay. ale yeast and lager yeast, and they're different species. So, oh. the ale yeast is the Saccharomyces cerevisiae, uh, whereas the lager yeast is Saccharomyces pastorianus. Okay. And so, and they do different things, and they brew differently too. So, mm-hmm. if we think of ales, they tend to hang out at the very top of the wort, at the very beer. They're, so the little creatures are living fermenter. at the top of the bottle. Yep. Okay. Mm-hmm. Whereas the lager yeast tend to be bottom fermenters, so they hang out by the bottom, and they actually like different temps. So if mm-hmm. you look oh. at if you look at the um, ale yeast, they like warmer temperatures, mm-hmm. and lager yeast like cooler temperatures. Okay. And, and there's other types of yeast too. Um, so you have Britannomyces, uh, which kind of gives a barnyard. Uh, kind of flavor to think <laughs> that in a lot of more, um, you know, kind of Belgian styles or um, farmhouse ales um, in places like the Netherlands or Belgium and France. Well, now mm-hmm. I kind of want to try those in bread. Yeah. I mean, there's other stuff too, but those are the main <laughs> ones that we see. Yeah. And yeah. here's the thing about yeast, though. When you hear like Clark talk about lager yeast liking cool temperatures and ale yeast liking warm temperatures and Belgian yeast you know, leaving sort of a barnyard flavor or whatever. Those yeasts have uh, now have been cultivated and produced to make, to do those things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, Kind of in the same way that domestic dogs are, right? Like the domestic dogs we have now are bizarre. Right. But I mean, when we started brewing 30,000 years ago or however long ago. And let me stop you right there. Okay. Um, (laughs) Yeah. Uh, Whichever one of you wants to kick us off, I'm fine with that. But let's just get a brief um, history of kind of... Let's just do human beings brewing, because I know that some other animals will eat fermented fruit and kind of set up situations in which fermented fruit can happen. Um, I know that some kinds of ants grow fungus and stuff like that, but Mm -hmm. let's just concentrate on humans um, brewing. Okay. And uh, where do we start? What were we doing, and how have we gotten to where we are now? It started in Sumeria. Okay. Yep. So I mean, we've been brewing, you know, since we started agriculture. So it's it's one of those very very early uh, processes that we've learned to master. It's one um, of the and, reasons we started al- uh, uh, architect uh, architecture yeah. uh, agriculture. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and, and so and it, it has driven agriculture too. Why mm-hmm. why we preferred certain grains and so. Um, we found that certain types of barley are better at this production than others. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, you know, that th- this kind of quest for fermented products is, is guided a lot of agriculture. Um, and it, I mean, it started, I'm sure, I mean, we don't have any verifiable proof of it, but I mean, it started by someone left some grain in a pot that got some mm-hmm. water in it. Yeah. And then there's so much yeast in the air it fell into that and it fermented and that person found it and said, I wonder what this tastes like and drank it. And yeah. then the rest is history. I mean, and yeah. then they were like, Whoa, yep. <laughs> <laughs> it makes me feel like this. Yeah. <laughs> so, and speaking of but, that, for yeah. all of my students that are under 21, this is mm-hmm. not carte blanche to go do this stuff. You have to That's wait. Right. The person yeah. who found it was 21. So, yes. um, yeah. <laughs> 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 um, but then they discover. But then you also discover that this is a great way for preserving not only grain but fruit or honey mm-hmm. or anything like that. It makes your crop. It stretches your crop so much further. Uh, that you know, and when water, so you've got that. So it does actually also, preserve the caloric content of. Oh yeah, uh, yeah. Beers have a high caloric content. 
Mm-hmm. You know, most you think of most twelve ounce beers that you'd probably drink, and they're going to be up, uh, you know, pretty close to two hundred calories. Mm-hmm. Okay, it's liquid food. It's liquid mm-hmm. bread. Mm-hmm. Um, so you know, and you know, it, it's it's one of those things that has been used as a food supplement. Uh, yeah, we see in history that also the brewing process, uh, the fermentation process, has it renders a lot of things that would mm-hmm. otherwise be dangerous to drink uh, or to mm-hmm. consume. Uh, safe. Mm-hmm. That's just the alcohol to water. bad stuff, right? Yeah, well, I mean, you know, you think of water and it, it has lots of different microbes and a lot of those microbes are not you know, things you want to ingest. Yeah. Um, so, part of the brewing process is that we have to boil things. Mm-hmm. And because we're boiling, we're sterilizing that water. So, mm-hmm. you know, to kind of bring it to a, a little bit more modern time, if we look back to, uh, you know, the cholera epidemic that they had in the 1800s in, in, in London mm-hmm. um, and it was killing large portions of the population and it was due to the water supply that they had. Um, they had open sewers, they were, those sewers were coming in contact with the drinking water Yeah. and you know they so were picking it up and drinking <laughs> My bad, my bad, I turned on the sink <laughs> <laughs> um, But you look at this, right, the folks that weren't getting ill were the brewers Mm-hmm um, and that's because, you know, even though they're using the same water supply, they were having to boil that wort for about 60 minutes or so. All right. That Anything that everything. was in there was, you know, killed. Cool. So cholera wasn't, you know, happening to them. And because they were brewers, and just like brewers today, they, they have shift beers. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, they were, they were the happiest and the healthiest of the bunch in, in well, London during that time. And, and during the cholera epidemic. I mean, like that was probably their shift beers were probably their meals for the day by and large. Also, yep. so ah, I mean, yep. okay, uh, so we have this ancient Sumerian. We're making mm-hmm. some kind of rough beer in a mm-hmm. pot, um, <laughs> yep. and then what was the next step after that? I assume we were doing that for a long time, but what, what well, was the next like trick or they, technical? They started recording it, so you could think of recipes. Um, mm-hmm. Even some of our earliest beer recipes are from the Sumerians and the Egyptians. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's cool. Um, so what? Yeah, so wait, you find what, it what in time periods do we have on that? It. What age are we talking about? Uh, well, jeez, I don't know. You know, the Sumerians. Have... It's like a long, long time ago. But that's. Yeah. Um, I'll look it up. That's got to be over. Eight, I'd say about six thousand years ago. Yeah. Seven thousand years ago. Um, again, not. Uh, that I don't know. I'm not so sure. I really don't know. Yeah, were. but <laughs> it's about that far back. The oldest recipe oh. looks like it's 3,900 years old. Oh, 39. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. 2000 BC or 2000? Right. Yeah, BC. Yeah. So pretty old. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's old. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, no. I mean, it's it's a long time back, and so they, this is stuff that they were rec- they were recording. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and, and sometimes because you know you think of. Um, there's these ties that they have, these different cultures, um, with their religion mm-hmm. and with the agriculture and the production of crops and food. Um, so even some of these recipes kind of take on a almost a, a sort of religious tone to them. Yeah, because it had to look like ma- like magic. I mean, you didn't know that these little creatures were living in there at that point. Mm-hmm. You didn't yeah. know. It, it was a blessing of the gods. <laughs> yeah, mm-hmm. and so it was a, what what science to us looks like magic to them. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and, you know, we, to be fair, I mean, we didn't really realize what was the driving force behind fermentation till, you know, the mid 1800s. Oh, mm-hmm. I guess so. And right? I think that was, yeah. uh, Louis Pasteur that actually figured that out. That's really cool. And so yeah. they had, I mean, by the, what, when did they pass the German pure beer purity laws, the 1600s. So they knew vaguely what it was. They just didn't quite know the science behind it. Well, they, it, uh, however, they didn't have yeast to that. That's true. That's true. So yeast was not part of the, the Rhine. That's Hutz very clock. true. Yeah. So um, they, they, they knew that the buildings were important, but they didn't know why. Right. Yeah. 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 Um, okay. So at that point, the really old stuff, they're making everything they're making beer mm-hmm. they're making wine they're making meads they're mm-hmm. they're doing the range of stuff um then as we move forward is it essentially been the same process once you wrote a recipe down has there been did, did the romans figure anything out the greeks did was there anything? well the, the romans it's it's interesting so you know you look at some of the 
some of the different cultures around um, Europe at the time. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the Mediterranean area, they, they're more about the wine. And beer is actually, depending on the culture, was looked to seem like a primitive kind of hick thing to do. So the Romans, they love their wine. Mm -hmm. You mm -hmm. know, um, but a no lot beer. of the surrounding folks to the north of them didn't. <laughs> they drank beer. And that was just due to their climate. And that was um, so just available so crops? Or is that Well, something... yeah. I mean, it's, it's, you know, barley grew well uh, up in, you know, northern parts of Europe, like Germany and, and France. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right? And if you think of wine, one of the main wine growing areas is, is Italy. Yeah. And that's where the Romans were. And, and then the Romans, they look at this as kind of, you know, these uncivilized tribes are drinking this, you know, uncivilized product. It's not wine. And so they mm -hmm. were kind of looked down upon. Um, also, barley is way quicker and easier to mm -hmm. grow than grapes. Yep. Uh, grapes take a lot of work, a lot of energy, and truly can take years before they're starting to produce grapes that you can do anything with. Yep. Barley, you can grow in a year, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, so it's a single season. crop. Okay, yeah. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah. All right, well, that's, that's really cool. And then so brewing processes were the same for them. They, they didn't bring anything new to it. Um, well, you know, hops are the big thing. So mm -hmm. that's the next big addition when we look at brewing. Oh, okay. Um, so, you know, they didn't initially use hops. Um, you know, prior to that, they would use herbs that were around. Um, they'd be throwing them in, you know, and sometimes these herbs are, nowadays we know they're really kind of bad for <laughs> you. Um, really? So what were, they, what were they doing that was bad for them? Well, what, they didn't know they were bad for them. Um, I mean, it's kind of, you know... They're exploring their options, I guess ah. is the way I describe it. Like when we think of what they were using, a lot of the other herbs that they were putting in their beer, they were mm -hmm. doing that to add flavor. Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, and so some things that you know that are flavorful are, are also toxic. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, I think they put wormwood in it for yep. a while, uh, which we know now can is not very good for you and no. can cause some hallucinations. Yeah. Yep. Uh, <laughs> So. But we, we think of those early types of beer as, as gruits. And, you know, they still, gruits are, it's kind of a medieval beer. Gruits is but it's spelled G R U E T S? Uh, G R U I T. Okay. All right. And, and we still see gruits produced, you know, today, although they're very rare. So, you know, the, I know in Belgium they have it. Um, you know, and but that's they, it's, we think of that as a medieval beer. Mm -hmm. And that's no yeah. hops, or it has no hops at all. Okay. Um, and that's how most beer was for most of its history was without hops. And so when hops did that is really get... a, a medieval thing? When oh, so medieval, so so um, turn of the last it, millennium. Yeah, about I think it's around the twelve hundred. Okay. Um, yeah, and, that sounds that sounds about right, Clark. Yeah, so it's you know, and we see that in more in like monastic cultures using it. Mm hmm. Um. You know, and they did that because it adds bitterness to the beer. That uh, that bitterness is when we say bitterness, it's not like bitter in the sense of like medicinal bitter, but it's it, it cuts the sweetness out of the beer. Yeah. Right. So if if you were to produce a beer today without any hops in it, it would be very sweet. I assume it, it would also be all alcoholic that... tasting, wouldn't it? No, not necessarily. I mean, it depends on the yeast. Oh, okay. um, yeah. If you if you have a yeast that's capable of really converting a lot of sugars, well then yeah, yeah but it, that would be like almost what we describe as being fusel. It'd be hot. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. it would give you that kind of warmth that you have if you're drinking like a whiskey, which oh, isn't okay. pleasant when you're drinking a beer. Yeah, I see uh, that's very strange tasting. But mm -hmm. like, if we think of the you know hops, they were added in to kind of add some bitterness and herbally notes. Um, hops also have some other uh, compounds that can give a wide range of, a wide range of flavors and aromas. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, they... What they started to notice is that when they were doing that, adding the hops actually caused the beer to remain stable longer. Um, yeah. Because the hops present. have an antiseptic quality to them. Okay, there's a preservative in there. Yep. Mm -hmm. Interesting. They're actually, I mean, and, yeah, they're, they can be, the compounds in the hops can be lethal to a lot of bacteria. And but that it doesn't is, impact the yeast. I, and I think there's some fair evidence that the addition of hops was at first exclusively for preservation mm -hmm. and mm. then it was like oh this tastes these nice. kind of taste good too yeah. let's yeah. let's add these in you know what i mean it was a happy accident but at the end of the at, at first it was a strictly utilitarian 
Mm -hmm. Okay, that's cool. Yeah. Okay, so we're in the 1200s. Wine is the same as it was thousands of years Mm ago. (laughs) Beer just got hops stacked onto it. Mm -hmm. Um, When's our next change? You know, I think it's just we start getting lager. That's the next change. Okay. So everything we've talked about now has been ale yeast. Okay. Um, And we start seeing the formation of lagers um, around 1400. Mm -hmm. And what Clark is talking, and that means like an ale, when you're fermenting ale yeast uh, to make your beer, uh, that means it's going to sit at at its optimal temperatures, and optimal is in quotation marks, but between like 65 degrees and, or even like, yeah, like 65 degrees and maybe 80 degrees. Okay. It's like its sweet spot. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Uh, Yeah. Loggers loggers enjoy cooler temperatures down to even like 50 degrees. Uh, Okay. And uh, the fermentation, doing that slows the fermentation down, Mm -hmm. uh, but also produces some interesting flavors and dryness to the beer itself. Okay. Uh, Loggers are very, very clean beers. Uh, mm -hmm. They are, they're very hard to brew. They're very clean and they are unforgiving to any sort of mistake. Yeah, I can imagine. Yes. Whereas ales can hide a lot. Mm-hmm. Okay. You can hide a lot of crimes around an ale. Uh, loggers, <laughs> yeah. you've really kind of, kind of got to know what you're doing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, and okay. not, that's not to say that it's difficult. You have to remember, at the end of the day, beer is just beer. It is not mm-hmm. a difficult thing to make, literally. Yeah. I mean, dum dums have been doing it for thousands of years. Yeah, uh, yeah. the first time <laughs> was on accident. With wine, so. Yeah, that, yeah exactly. that doesn't mean it's good though. True. No, it doesn't. It just means mean it's drinkable. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you can drink it and not get sick. It's not poison. Well, for the the vast majority of human history, pretty yeah. much everything has just been. Well, I can eat it or drink it, and it won't make me sick. Yes. Yep. <laughs> Taste was very secondary to not dying. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so we're in the 1400s. We have this new mm-hmm. kind of yeast, this new cooler brewing process, and mm-hmm. wine hasn't changed still? No, nope, it's pretty much the same. All right, so what's our and, next and, thing? You know, I, and I think the next thing, I think, is the, the purity loss, the German purity loss. Okay, would you would one of you go through that those real quick? I'll let, I'll let Bo take a swing in that one. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, Clark. Well, the German pure, uh, the There's Germans, only three things initially, but now we got four. Yeah. Uh, well, the German purity laws are laws that date back to, I think, the 1600s. Uh, and they are the laws that say pretty much, if you want to call this beer, it can have water, barley, and hops in it. That's it. Mm-hmm. And then they mm-hmm. added ye- yeast is now part of uh, yep. that. Yeah, but that's the only thing that could be in your beer uh, yep. for you to call it beer, um, and so I mean, it's, and that is that is an industrial that is government um, looking over industry is what that is. Uh, yeah, yeah. At the time, it's, there were a it's lot a of regulatory people. action. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. There you go. Uh, because before people would stick in like, hey, well, you know, my grandma liked putting this in the beer. Exactly. And then yeah. you know, people get sick and they get killed yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. and um, germany also exported a yeah. lot of beer they were they looking did. out for themselves uh, yeah so uh, and those those laws are still in effect in germany they are a world heritage law mm-hmm. now oh um, that's cool that's really so. interesting mm-hmm. uh and so and so germany really is sort of the birthplace i would probably say the birthplace of industrial beer making that yeah. Like, uh, and that, yeah. you know for the most part though when, when we look at that too is that's kind of a rarity. So mm-hmm. everywhere else that's making beer is not doing it on that kind of industrial scale. Um, at that time. At that time. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So beer for a long time was more of the house thing. That was that was something that you would make. The mm-hmm. like your wife would would make beer. It, yep. it was actually like you know you Brewsters, which are were women brewers. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Making that's something... beer. It was it was not typically a male thing. Mm-hmm. Interesting. At that point. For a uh, very, very long time, women made yep. beer. Yep. That's really and funny so, compared to now. Well, mm-hmm. now it's male-dominated. Yeah, um, completely. Yeah, and that's when we start getting the... That that kind of arises when we start getting the industrialization of beer. Uh, so, so that it becomes masculine. Yes, mm-hmm. because it, it makes money at that point. <laughs> right. right. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's not just no, I mean, you're it, making it for the household. So it was, everything was yeah. local. So mm-hmm. every household had their beer recipe. 
Um, mm-hmm. Every local pub had a couple of their beer recipes. Everybody brewed. Mm-hmm. That was just what you did. And it, especially when you look at England, they really did that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, but it's, it's, not, it's not a commercial enterprise for the most part. And also, the, and, uh, having a brewery or brewers in your town also led to other industry and other mm-hmm. things. Yeah, uh, if you got your, if you were a baker, you got your yeast or barm is what they called it mm-hmm. from the brewer. You would go over to the brewer. He would give you some leftover dregs from making beer. And you would take that home, keep it fed sort of like a sourdough. And that's mm-hmm. how you would make your bread. I mean, that's, yeah. that was your leveting for your bread. Well, and even then, like if, if you think of it, early breweries tended to have a bakery associated mm-hmm. with it. Mm-hmm. And, and you still see that today when you when you think of uh, monastic traditions in brewing. Oh, really? Yep. So there'd be like a yep. brewery so, and a bakery in the same building, or, or next exactly, to each other? they'd be okay. right next to each other. So Fire you would source. Have, yeah, I mean, you have all that malt, the spent grains, mm-hmm. and the spent grains become the source of, you know, your flour. Um, uh, you have your yeast from the brewing process, which becomes the way for you to, you know, you know, make the bread rise. Mm-hmm. Um, you have and, a and you giant furnace to yep. make to boil the beer that you use to heat your oven. So you might as um, well make bread at the same time. Yeah, that absolutely. Makes sense. No wasting fuel. Mm-hmm. Um, yep. So that takes us up to that point. Um, after the German laws, what what are we getting after that? Um, would it just be the industrial revolution essentially? We, we get the industrial aspects of it, and so this industrialization really takes off in Britain. Okay. Mm-hmm. Because you got to think about the rise of empires here. So Britain becomes a huge empire, um, and they are having to transport their beer all over the place. Um, they also we see the rise of some styles that we know today. So okay. it's hard to know like what beer was like. And if you look at real old recipes, brewing recipes, most of them sound pretty awful. <laughs> mm-hmm. I know some you... brewers who have made that the, their brewery got ancient recipes and made yep. them, and they were like. These are ter- like the you they have to change the recipe just to make it drinkable to the modern palate. Uh, yeah, and, uh, and you start getting this is where you get the rise of the porter. Mm-hmm. So the porter becomes the if you think of like today like the American light lager as being the big beer that everybody has and that we find all over the world. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, you can you can travel anywhere and find a, a Bud Light. Yeah, right. Um, this the porter was the original Bud Light. Okay, so that's what everybody had. That's what everybody yeah. Made. Well, that's what that's what all the the Brits did. Okay, and they because were they were the empire. The, you know, when we still look at Germany, and we and we look at Czechoslovakia, um, and the, or Bohemia at that point, mm-hmm. they were they were still doing their loggers. Mm-hmm. And you know, you still had. Belgium, the Netherlands, and France kind of doing their farmhousey things. They weren't doing porters. Porters were really a an English thing, and that's that becomes the first industrial beer. Mm-hmm. Like it's it's a style that is made for that. And you know, when we talk about porters then versus porters now, I mean, a, a porter was just basically an ale. Um, it wouldn't be it wouldn't be the same porter that you'd make today. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay, and and wine, I assume, is about the same as well. We're just moving to industrial production scale at this point. Yeah, I mean, wine basically that becomes just a little bit more industrialized to well, the scale well, of it. But wine has also been a wine. The process of wine is a lot less labor intensive than <laughs> making beer, and so it, uh, wine has. I mean. They were industrially making wine essentially in the Roman Empire just yep. because the Roman Empire was so big and how much they drank. Do you know yeah, what I mean? Giant, uh, giant vats of it. Yeah, exactly. And I mean, they still did giant vats of beer too, but the wine process is just, it le- uses way less energy. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and so it is not a, it, the Industrial Revolution didn't change how you make wine too terribly much. Do you know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. Uh, as opposed to beer, where it was like, oh, wait, we can run a gas line into here and it's just going to burn. You know what I mean? Yeah. That's way easier uh, well, than it, throwing chunks of wood under a fire. For and, exactly. and this is where exactly. you, you start seeing industrial malting. Mm-hmm. You know, so malting is an essential part of the brewing process. You, mm-hmm. you know, brewing with unmalted grains is not good. Yeah. Um, because you, you need that modification of the grain to actually do the process. Um, mm-hmm. 
And, you know, you know, still today, some breweries have a malting facility associated with them, but that's rare. But we start mm-hmm. to see the compartmentalization of these different processes. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And malting is what, what you do when you malt is you, you, you grow the barley, obviously. And then you take the barley, you, uh, you wet it down so it starts to germinate, so it starts to become, it's, it's essentially going to sprout again. Yeah. And so what it really had, but what it's really doing deep down is it is building up a lot of sugar inside of it to give that seedling energy to grow into a barley plant. Mm -hmm. Well, you start that process, but then you stop it by putting it in an oven. So all that sugar is still in that little small kernel of barley, but Mm. uh, it's not going to germinate now, but you still got all that sugar. So then you grind. And so it's a pretty scientific process, uh, but, you can you can roast that barley to different levels of toastiness, mm-hmm. and that will change. That can change the flavor and color and texture of your beer completely. The more or less you uh, malt it, okay. not, um, yeah. And so and, that's and, where malting comes from, and that's where, the, like Clark was saying, in the Industrial Revolution, that's one of the big advances of in beer in the Industrial Revolution is being able to control malt so much better. Yeah. Um, and does that pretty much take us to the you, modern time? That brings you pretty much to modern times, except I guess you yeah. get the different varieties, uh, our better understanding of the different varieties of hops, uh, the different grains. But no major technical um, advantages or differences or... Yeah, and no I mean, now things are, are, are much more global. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, we could buy, you know, when we think of malts, we're getting malts oftentimes from Canada. Um mm. You know, because barley grows at kind of cooler temps. Yeah. So we find it like Canada, like Alberta, yeah. you know, kind of, you know, Manitoba. The plain states. The plain yeah, states. The, plain states are... the normal plain states. Um, you'll see it in Britain and, and Germany and whatnot. Well, I assume that there is a um, lot of grain. Yeah. The one other thing that would be more modern would be things like adding in um, corn syrup or uh, oh, that's... rice syrup and things like that, yeah. right? Yeah. Yes, that is okay. definitely an industrial change there. Yeah. Uh, and that would that be like is... 1950s-ish when that started? Probably that would... earlier than that. Yeah, um... After Prohibition. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And, um, then just... and it is. It's, it's, a cheap, it's a cheap answer to a problem. Okay. Um, yeah. So a lot of times the issue is, you know, you want sugar, but you don't want to impart the flavor of the grain. Okay. And that's a nice thing about corn syrup. Corn syrup has no flavor. Yeah, it's just sugar. It's just sugar. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, rice syrup has no flavor. It's just sugar. Yeah. Um, so it's a, it's a quick way for you to add more sugar to the mix. It allows you to cut back the amount of grain you need to use, uh, which like the malted barley. And so it you're is a cheaper sugar, beer. rice, rice, corn are way cheaper yeah, than than bar- barley. barley. Yeah, that makes good sense. Mm-hmm. Um, and you can make if you're using rice syrup, or corn syrup, or whatever in your beer. Making the beer goes so much faster because you're just dissolving syrup in water as opposed to boil and grain for 60 or 90 minutes. <clears throat> yeah. Trying to extract all that sugar. And I imagine uh, that well, taking an industrial quantity of liquid up to boiling is not. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, um, well, I mean, if you think of like, like today, uh, hard seltzers. Yeah. Yeah. Hard seltzers are just like a, a corn syrup. Okay. Yeah. And, you know, that's all you're using. You're not using malted grains at all. Yeah. No, so exactly. it, it, it's really just a very simple, and, you know, you're not typically using hops. <laughs> yeah. So it's just, a, it's just a boil to sterilize, and then, boom, add your yeast, and you, you're good to go. Okay, cool. Very and quick. Not that we're going to talk, not that I want to concentrate on it today at all, yeah. but um, when did distilling get, in, um, get into the mix? <sighs> Distilling's been around for a long time too. Uh, mm-hmm. I don't, I don't know when it started, but I mean, like it's, it relatively short compared to like brew, like brewing. Are we talking about five hundred yeah. years, a thousand? Yeah, probably. I would say five hundred or less. Okay. Yeah. Um, I don't know. Uh, yeah, I don't know the exact date myself, but yeah, that's why uh, I didn't want to really concentrate on it because I knew that wasn't our, the point of our conversation. But, but you well, know, like um, when well, we look yeah. at it, it's a very similar process initially. Yeah. Yeah, it's the same initial ingredients. You're just taking the water out. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah. According okay. to something I just literally just looked up, there is clear evidence of distilling uh, from Arabia in the ninth century. Uh, okay. So 
So about a thousand years ago. Yeah, about a thousand years ago. Cool. So but the first still time a long we see time it. ago, but yeah. comparatively speaking, not very long. Yeah, so, the first yeah. time we see it industrially is probably, or not industrially, but in great quantities, sounds like 1500s. Mm-hmm. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, well, I think that's a good history, unless there's any little bits that, that either of you can think of that you would want somebody to know. I, th- I think we covered it all. All right. Awesome. <laughs> yeah, that was, that was pretty extensive. <laughs> I hope we didn't jump in too deeply too quickly, but nope, yeah. That's fine. We like that. Uh, my students are used to me going off on tangents for okay, good. Yeah, cool. quite some time. <laughs> Um, okay, um, let's get back to some of the more particular parts of this. Um, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Let's talk about local and regional yeast. Um, we've talked about two types of yeast so far, the the um, lager and the other one was ale, right? Mm-hmm. Yep. Um, now, I know that for like sourdoughs and things like that, for people making bread, there's this real big thing about local and regional yeasts. Um mm-hmm. This I'm not sure which one of you wants to take this, but go for it. Uh, what am I going to find with different yeasts from different places? These are the little creatures making our alcohol. Well, I mean, they're going to do things differently. They all have their their metabolic processes are a little bit different. Um, when we think of local yeast, you know, it's a lot of times the same sort of species, or mm-hmm. uh, like that we think of as being the brewer's yeast. There are other yeasts that could do a lot of this stuff too, but mm-hmm. um, we find them growing on plant material. So you could go out with a swab and swab a flower or swab a leaf and plate it, mm-hmm. and you'd end up with yeast on there. Oh, so you can yeah, go a petri are, dish? Yeah, just they're, like... they're everywhere. Oh. There are they're thousands ubiquitous. and thousands and thousands of kinds of yeast, and they are all just floating around in the air all the time. So uh, when I'm making a beer, when you're making beer or wine, are you using one... Are you using just a poodle, or are you using a few different kinds that are all mixed together? Typically, it's, you're using one. Okay. Mm-hmm. It, but it just depends. I mean, yep. I, I in the homebrew store, I've got packages of yeast that are very strictly controlled, come from a very sterile, controlled environment, and they are this one kind of yeast. Mm-hmm. I've also got some that are just, yeah, we put like three or four in here, and you're going to get the best of each one. Do you know what I mean? Okay, uh, yeah. So it just a. You know, it all depends on what what you're looking for. Uh, yeah. yeah, I mean, and, and beer originally for a very very long time. I mean, you would ferment your beer, and there's a lot of breweries that still do it. You just ferment your beer in open vats and just open the windows and let wild yeast come in. Yeah, and do its thing. Yeah, uh, I actually have a a little bit of a um, story about that. We make a lot of bread and so our house kind of just has yeast in it Mm -hmm. and Mm -hmm. i left a bottle of pineapple juice i like poured it into one (laughs) of those ikea clamp top (laughs) bottles Mm -hmm. um clamped the top down left it and left it on the counter for a few days not thinking Mm -hmm. and of course it fermented and the co2 built up pressure and i opened it and I now have a permanent uh, pineapple stain on the ceiling of my <laughs> living room. <laughs> yeah, so I definitely know that you can get it right out of the right out of the environment. Mm-hmm. Yep, and it can make some very very delicious beer. Uh, but it can make some very gross ones too. Absolutely. <laughs> so and it's you know, kind it, of rolling that, the dice. Well, that well is it is the biggest part of your local yeast when you're talking about doing wild fermentation. If your local yeast is sort of clean like uh switzerland they do a lot of wild sour beers because they you know they're up there in the mountains it's clean yeast it's you know uh the humidity's nice i can't imagine what a wild fermented alabama beer would taste like it would <laughs> yeah. you know everything's just so wet and uh <laughs> i think it, i think it could be pretty rough uh well, you know, and there's ways that they get around this, too. Uh, places mm-hmm. that still do open fermentation often practice something called blending. Okay. Mm-hmm. And so what they will do is they'll take batches between years or, you know, where maybe they had, like, let's say 2018 had a really great batch, and they'll reserve some of it aside. And then mm-hmm. when they did the 2019 batch, they would mix in. Mm-hmm. And it, they try to do that to give them – more of a consistency so that's uh, you some can of think the of old living yeast that they're trying to get in there <laughs> no the, the finished no. beer the finished beer okay the so finished we... product they'll blend it a lot of times and that's just to make a more consistent product otherwise every time so for example in, in brussels they have cantillon okay and cantillon does open fermentation and oh. it, this is in the middle of the city 
And oh, so geez. one year they will have a product that they really, really like. Um, and then the next year they might have one that's a little bit rough around the edges. And what they'll do is they'll add them together and they keep doing this process of adding and adding. And okay. so by blending it, you get a more consistent product. So I can get a Cantillon from 2018 and then one from 2019. They'll be different, but they're not so greatly different that it's a problem for the consumer. Okay. You know, but the you know, you don't want to start different. For most people, they don't want to go in and get a different experience. It's, yeah. it's why if you go to a major macro brewery like Budweiser, you know, it's it's a lab. Yeah. It, yeah. it looks like a it looks like a factory in a lab. It's not not like you know Cantillon. They're um, not open. And, but the they're very consistent. I can get a Bud Bud anywhere in the world, and it's going to taste the same no matter where. Yep. What the giant industrial brewers do is amazing. Yep. Uh, it is truly, truly amazing. And I know there, there's a lot to be said about giant industrialized beer uh, on, on many di- from all different sides. But at the end of the day, they're taking an, an, an agricultural product that varies literally from week to week. Your sugar contents, your, you know, everything. Mm-hmm. And they make it taste exactly the same yeah. anywhere in the world. It, I mean, you can, and they brew it all over the world. So you can p- get a Budweiser from Singapore, from Africa, from Germany, and from America, and put them all together in a line, and you won't be able to taste it. Yeah, that's a certain kind of skill. And mm-hmm, yeah. mm-hmm. but it's I mean, funny. with with these local yeast, so you know, we do have them, and you can culture them. So, um, can, so can I know there are people that have been interested in doing of that. going from this wild local yeast to something that I can pick up at Bo's shop in a packet. It's it's a long it's a long process, but initially what happens is what you would do is, let's say you know if you're being exploratory again, like I would swab a plant, swab a flower, um, go back to a microbiology lab, and we have nutrient like media. So when we talk about media, it's basically um, stuff that you're going to grow it on, mm-hmm. right? And it's going to have all the nutrients. It will have uh, things to kind of keep out unwanted things such as bacteria or other yeast that we're just not interested in. And I would streak it out on there. So I'd just rub, take this, you know, the swab and just kind of rub the top of the media mm-hmm. and grow it at a warm temp for a bit and see what grows. And then what I can do is I could take, you know, you'll get individual little colonies or groups of, of the yeast. I can take those and... Um, go out grow them in more media and you keep growing them and growing them to get you know you're pretty certain that you're only working with one organism how would you and then you would you do a trial batch with that so it's a lot of you know a lot of experimenting um it's not easy to find a a, like a novel strain that tastes good oh (laughs) Um, um the other thing you could do is you could work with beer that had been sitting out and something funky happened and maybe that funkiness is good and you could try to make recreate it. You can actually culture the yeast from that beer, um, work with that, and you know. But you have a lot less control what's in there. Um, okay, cool. Yeah, that that kind of makes sense. Um, so you're you're essentially doing the going back to our dog analogy. You're essentially breeding out the traits you like. Um, exactly. Yeah, absolutely. That's and, yeah. 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 I'm gonna start using this beer, this dog analogy in this shop. It's a very good one. Yeah, yeah just have little <laughs> little dog pictures. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So the uh, the opening the window and letting it ferment is just like finding that stray in the woods and taking it home, right? <laughs> yep. Okay. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Just you sure. never know what's gonna. Ha- you're not quite sure what's gonna happen. Yep. Could be good. Could be in a bad. <laughs> but you know it's gonna live forever. <laughs> um, okay, so that's how we get a yeast that we like, um, and there are a bunch of different kinds. Mm-hmm. While we're on the topic of ingredients, are there regional ingredients as well, or are we just talking about those three or four? Th- I, I know that with like fruit wines, and, and I imagine that meads are also very special. We'll talk about those in a minute. Um, but for beer, are, are there regional ingredients, or are yes. we pretty much stick into this? Okay, so it, it's regional. Uh, you can have regional. So mm-hmm. hops, you know, the same variety of hops grown in different parts of the world mm-hmm. will taste different. Or they will have a little bit different alpha acid qualities to them. They would have uh, different types of secondary compounds. So I could take a hop and grow it in Michigan and mm-hmm. then take that same hop variety and grow it in New Zealand. Mm-hmm. And I would end up with differences in them. And that's due to the nutrients that they're taking up from the environment. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, water. 
an essential ingredient is very different from wherever you are. Yeah. So the water in the south that we have is very different from the water up in the north. It's very different from the water that you would get in England, uh, yeah. the water that you would get in the Czech Republic. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and in fact, a lot of times brewers, we, we change the way our water looks, the, the different com- the different kind of mineral components in it to emulate um, the water of a, a specific region. Yeah, so there's a, doing there's a big like regionality a week in water. Ago or two weeks ago maybe where you were making water from somewhere? I was making um, water that was, well, from my porter, I was making water that looked like London water. Oh, yeah, that was it. Yeah. Because London is where we think of the porter as coming from. And so I was like, all right, I want to have, you know, a water profile that looks like what you would see there. And, and that's very different than what we have in Montgomery. Yeah. So I had to add a bunch of different um, components, so adding gypsum, um, adding, you know, calcium chloride, all kinds of stuff to it to kind of cool. change up the chemistry just enough that it starts to look more like London's water rather than Montgomery's mm-hmm. water. That's cool. uh, and that's going to give my beer a more traditional English flavor to it or an English mouthfeel. God, that's mm-hmm. so wild that just changing, the, changing well, the, what makes the water is going to change it and, that much. But I guess wine, that makes sense because tap water tastes different place to place. Mm-hmm. And wine growing, they use a term a lot called terroir. It's mm-hmm. a French word yeah. that means soul and uh, soul. And so it, um, and it is the flavor you get from something from where it is mm-hmm. like, yeah. um, and that's very much in beer, but I mean, they talk about how grapes grown in this soul over here taste, are they the exact same grape? Yeah. They're, they've been watered and cultivated the exact same way, but the grapes from this side of this hill, tastes completely different than grapes from the other side of that hill. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's the same way with beer. I mean, it, it's just like Clark was saying with that, like a hop had grown in Michigan and a hop grown in New Zealand. They're going to, they're, they could be the exact same, uh, but because of the soil chemistry, the sunlight they get, the water they get, the kind of water they get, all, everything that plays into it is going to completely change the flavor of them. Mm-hmm. And you could probably taste them and they will taste completely different Uh, and and it's important to note too that because we're dealing with agricultural products mm -hmm. like the barley that we utilize changes from year to year Mm -hmm. and so bo would bo could talk more about this but when he gets an order of barley he Mm -hmm. gets a sheet associated with that that gives Mm -hmm. specifications of that grain that he received so so what metrics are on the sheet like that you would see that they differ it's just it's essentially a, a a a it's a data sheet. Um, mm-hmm. Let me see. Let me. I don't have one with me right here, but let me pull up real quick just some grain on uh, one yeah, of my suppliers' really cool. websites. I'm just interested to see like what's because like when you buy bread flour, essentially what you get is a protein content. Right. Um, well, you're, you'll get that too. So you'll get a protein mm-hmm. content. You'll get. Um, we usually see the protein content in terms of um, free amino, like, <laughs> like uh, I can't remember. It's like free amino nitrogen mm-hmm. um, or fan um, because those those aminos are going to be utilized for the yeast to build their proteins. Okay. Uh, you'll get a, a moisture content that changes from year to year yeah. um, mm-hmm. and that has implications. Um, you'll get diastatic power, which is basically enzymatic power. That's that changes. its ability to turn carbohydrates into sugars, right? Yep. Or starches mm-hmm. into sugars. Okay. Yep. But there are a bunch of different things on there that vary, um, and, and it does, and, and you can look at these these differences. And so when Bo gets a shipment in, it could be the same grain. So he'll get, let's say he from Cargill or BSG, he gets two, you know, pale two row. Mm-hmm. Right. All right, barley. All right. He'll look at that, that sheet from last year versus a sheet this year, there'll be differences in them. And, and hopefully those differences aren't significant because then you got to start doing, if they are, and you're – working as a brewer, then what you'll start doing is blending your grains mm-hmm. yeah, you have to, change uh, to get a more, yeah. yeah, because you don't want your beer to change from year to year. So for example, if you're making like, um, you know, like Oscar blues is doing their brewing, right. And they're mm-hmm. making their Dale's pale ale, right. They want Dale's pale ale from this year to next year to be the same beer. Mm-hmm. They don't want it to have a, they don't want it to be a, a variable kind yeah. of beer. They don't want a, 2018 version 
in the 2019 version, the 2020 version. So in order to prevent that, what they'll be doing is they'll be looking at the grain that they receive and they will be, if there are significant differences or they're outside of their specifications, they'll start actually blending things together to, to kind of get things to be more in the middle. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Hops cool. do this too. Hops change from year to year, yeah. mm-hmm. uh, especially in amino, uh, in their alpha acid content. So they're the, what's going to play a major role in bittering. Okay, and, so that's I mean, the mm-hmm. metric that, that describes that bitter flavor. Mm-hmm. Well, it's part of it, yeah. Alpha acid is what you said? Yeah, they're the alpha acids. Um, and there are a couple different types of al- a- uh, alpha acids, but they need to be, you know, starting to get into chemistry terms here. They need to be isomerized. Okay. That's why we have to do a 60-minute boil and oh, why okay. we add the hops at 60 minutes rather than, you know, for bitterness, we add them at 60 rather than at the very end of the product uh, process. Mm-hmm. It takes a long time to change the shapes of those alpha acids. And it's those al- alpha acids that contribute to what we call uh, the International Bitterness Unit, or IBUs, okay. which tells how bad the beer is. And that is really the number that your average beer consumer wants to pay attention to. It's yeah. the IBU number. Yeah, we'll get um, into that a little bit later, when because I, I, I do want to have a section specifically talking about when I look at a bottle, what am I looking for? Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, mm-hmm. But while we're on ingredients, um, I assume that that means that sometimes you get an ingredient and you make a recipe that you just can't make again until you get an ingredient that matches. Sometimes you can. So okay. there, yeah. there, there are times that you got to get a little bit uh, creative. <laughs> where you got to get creative, um, yeah. and you might end up with something a little bit different. I, I, I know from homebrewing that happens to me. Mm-hmm. Um, I'll be looking. I'll have a recipe in mind, and sometimes I'll go to get the supplies, and you know you. you Sometimes you don't have the supplies that you need, and you yeah. just yeah. work with what you have. Um, and, they, and brewers do that too. Brewers change up the recipes all the time. So mm-hmm. they'll do a batch of something, and they'll look at it, and they'll be like, you know, I like this flavor, but maybe I could try something with a little bit more biscuit flavor. And they might throw in a malt that will give a little bit more biscuit flavor. Mm-hmm. Um, so you can you can do that. Hmm. Okay. It's just like cooking, you know, yeah. a, a culinary arts. It's every time you add a little it. more or a little less of each thing until mm-hmm. you're slowly yep, that's a gr- yep. winnowing it down. Um, mm-hmm. Now, you were talking about earlier before hops, or mm-hmm. yeah, before hops, they were adding all sorts of herbs and things like that. Is that coming back into fashion or are they getting f- those flavors some other way? Um, in, in short, <laughs> no, it's not coming back into, into favor. Um, Gruits are, it's a very rare type of beer. Most people, I mean, it's an herbaceous kind of thing. You can do it. It's just don't, don't work with hops. Yeah. So like bog myrtle works. Uh, people would use rosemary. Um, mm-hmm. You know, there's a bunch of different things that you can use. And, and the different types of herbs that you use is really based on what's available to you and what your palate enjoys. Oh, Clark, make a rosemary gruit. That's what I want. <laughs> <laughs> That sounds I awesome. recently made a rosemary saison, so... Oh, really? It's interesting. Yep. Mm-hmm. Um, so, if I am tasting, like, strawberries in a beer, where is that coming from? Probably strawberries. <laughs> well, you just said we're not putting other things in beer. You can... Those are adjuncts. Oh, so also, we're doing hops so they, Those don't follow those the Ryan Hoska boat. They're also... Um, they're also... Uh, there are yeasts that will leave a strawberry flavor. Uh, yeah. Oh, specifically strawberry, really? Yeah, well, absolutely. Yeah. Oh, that's crazy. Uh, there are the, there are a lot of yeasts that can, uh, and this is getting well beyond technically what I know. I mean, you know what I mean? The science of it, I don't yeah, know a lot about. That's fine. But yeah, you can, there, they'll leave banana flavors or some mm-hmm. that'll leave strawberry flavors or some that will leave just, um, just no flavor at all. There's some that will leave flavors that, it's, and the polite way to call it is barnyard flavors, yeah. mm-hmm. uh, but it's really animal shit. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and and for whatever reason, that flavor does work in some beers. Uh, yeah. But um, so um, yeah, the 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 chemistry that happens in the fermentation can be really truly amazing with the yeah. flavors it leaves and creates. So mm-hmm. with these, so. I think you call them uh, you call them adjuncts. Yep. So th- these are things that are added in on top of those basic three or four ingredients. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So 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 that that range can probably be pretty much anything, right? Oh yeah. 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 So uh-huh. I mean, when we think of when we talk about 
Budweiser making their beer, they make their beer with a large portion of adjunct. And it's not uncommon to do that. It's just you're, you're not going to – the German purity law, you're not going to meet. Well, yeah, yeah, of course. But, like, um, if you're trying to that, make something that tastes like something specific, you can just throw that in the initial batch, right? Typically. Oh, for sure. Yeah. 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 Um, there are people who make, like, strawberry milkshake beers and Ew. stuff like yep, that. Gross. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but, but I, I mean, that's also how you like, can get like uh, fruit flavors or herb yep. flavors, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, chocolate flavors, coffee flavors. Yep. So they're really uh, just throwing coffee in there. Well, yeah. sometimes they can. Okay. You can actually some of the malts themselves. If you get a really dark malt that's been really high kilned at high temperature, mm-hmm. it will have that natural kind of coffee f- flavor to it. Okay, um, cool. Without but adding coffee, but you can add coffee. The problem with adding coffee sometimes is that you get a, a little bit of a slick with it, and you that's get the oil off the top. Yeah. Yeah. But usually, but, like, yeah, but, you know, you'll, you'll, the depending on when you add it, the yeast can incorporate a lot of those little oils. So back onto to re, onto regional ingredients and these adjuncts mm-hmm. that we're ta- we're talking about. Um, I assume the United States is kind of just a melting pot of things, just because it's from everywhere. But if are there places that do use specific adjuncts uh, or is it just yeah. so homogenized now that, you know, people use adjuncts based on where they are. So, you know, if you think of, you know, like Africa, for example, barley mm-hmm. does not grow in Africa. Nope. So they would use like millet. Okay. Mm-hmm. And what, what, what um, flavor th- difference is that going to be? Uh, a world of difference. It's our, uh, you know, I've not had a millet beer, but it's not going to be the same as a barley beer. Uh, molasses, for example, mm-hmm. oh, if you think of yeah, sorghum. True. So sorghum used to be something that was used in the U.S. Um, that's because it was easier to grow than kind barley. Of that like molassesy sort of flavor, that darker sugar yeah. flavor. Okay. Mm-hmm. And, and you look at a lot used... of your recipes; they use molasses. Mm-hmm. Grits have been used a lot yep. in brewing. Uh, uh, rice has been used a lot in brewing. Uh, um, all sorts of stuff. I mean, uh, I mean, grits are corn. So I mean, just cor- using corn as your uh, base as opposed to barley there yeah there the, and, and at the end of the day beer comes down to what is growing around where you live yeah mm-hmm. and that's how people started making it do you know what i mean yeah. um it's just sort of that simple um i think at this point even worldwide it's so i mean you can get whatever pretty by and large you can get pretty much whatever you want whenever you want it now yeah. um so you can make the same beer over and over and over again as opposed to being like well we've got some rice and some corn and oh look i found this millet as well or whatever yeah um yeah. to do what you need to to make what you want to make so now in the craft brewing scene um are we seeing that more globalized um production of where you're just grabbing whatever you need specifically purchase um, well or are you seeing people kind of going back kind of like um i think the thing i would draw uh a parallel to might be like the the southern food traditions that are kind of coming back of where mm-hmm. a lot of these ingredients that have been set aside for the more common thing are coming back because they just have so much interest in them it's a bit of both okay. I so think it, i mean go ahead, the, big, the big the big commercial guys are still going to be using stuff on a much more industrial scale oh yeah yeah um but i mean you you think of some of the smaller craft breweries um, and yeah, I mean, a lot of them are taking a local approach, um, and it depends on where you are. You know, I think if you, if you're looking at here in Alabama, it's a little harder um, because we don't have hops here. We don't really have, you know, a local barley set up here. Mm-hmm. Uh, but if you look at Michigan, they grow barley up there. They grow hops up there. Um, so they tend to source a little bit more locally um, when they can. It also depends, and this is really what it boils down to. It really just depends on what your brewing philosophy is, yep. okay. uh, and what if you're on a commercial brewery, what is what's the what, what's your philosophy in your commercial brewery? Uh, do you yep. want? I mean, it, there are people who may have breweries that they're doing nothing but pushing the envelope of what they can get and do. Uh, mm-hmm. Cool. And there are other breweries that are doing nothing but pure tradition. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then there are breweries who are sort of, and I think this is the most of them are sort of right in the middle. Uh, yeah. Yep. But um, I mean, there's a brewery in Michigan called Scratch Brewing that they're like, um, 
they they forage most of their a lot of their ingredients. I think they have a local malting house where they get their barley. Mm-hmm. They have a wood fired uh, um, um, mash tun, which is what you bo- a bowl kettle that you boil your beer in. Yep. Um, I mean, and so and compare that to the new breweries that you see popping up everywhere that are just sleek and modern and. Yeah. Uh, and, and, you so, know, even then you may see like some of the smaller ones. So I, I think of a local version of this. So if we look at um, District Brewing up in Birmingham, mm-hmm. yeah, um, they have a beer that is like a raspberry kind of beer. And what they are doing and, you know, talking to the owners is that um, the owner would go out along the roadside around this time of year and start collecting dewberries off the highway. <laughs> mm-hmm. right. You can see those now. Like if you take a walk through your neighborhood, they're weedy, little tiny raspberry things that grow you know, right to the ground, hence dewberry. And you could collect them, mm-hmm. and that's what they do. They collect a bunch of them, and that's how they make their beer. And so it's, mm-hmm. that's a local ingredient that they're incorporating into that. Yeah, um, that's cool. Yeah. So you can there's do a, that. There's a cool – there's a great brewery, in, and I don't want to turn this into just brewery talk. No, that's fine. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but there's a wonderful brewery in Durham called Full Steam, and Full Steam does. Uh, you can buy their beer in Montgomery. You can buy it at the Whole Foods, uh, and I'm, maybe some other places. But anyway, they are a very much a uh, farmy, locally sourced brewery. They do everything they can, and they have a beer with uh, pawpaw. Yep. In them, uh, which are uh, America's only native stone fruit. Oh, cool. Uh, uh, and they're not a very well they're not an ingredient used in a lot of things but they are delicious and um i mean that's sort of their philosophy and so mm-hmm. like i said like i said i mean it's it's all that comes down to what your brewing philosophy is and what you are looking to do um, yeah cool all right that makes a lot of good sense um okay so i think that before we move on to brewing or breweries specifically um I think one thing I really want to get from both of you is I'm at the store. I'm Uh looking at all these things Mm -hmm. without being able to taste them. Mm -hmm. What are the things that I can find on a bottle but on a bottle label Mm -hmm. might help me. Okay. Sure. First thing I would look at would be IBUs. Okay. Bitterness is, is something that most people they they have an opinion about. <laughs> and the, the IBU is what? Hmm? The IBU is uh, what? The International Bitterness Unit. Okay. Yep. And it's going to tell you essentially how hoppy your beer is. Yep. So it's the Scoville, um, but for beer. kind of yeah, okay, kind yep. of yeah. But let's let's back up a little further than that, actually. Okay. Yeah. Uh, if you don't, I mean, it, start with what you like. Mm-hmm. If you if you like Miller Lite, mm-hmm. Miller Lite is quote as a quote unquote pilsner. Okay, so if you like a crystal clear golden beer, mm-hmm. look for something that's like a pale ale or a lager or a pilsner, uh, something like that. So start with what you like, yep. and then you can go from there. Uh, yeah, stay within style. Stay within style. Yes. Uh, because I think that's one of the reasons a lot of people drink are, are very excited about IPAs and stuff uh, is because they are sort of like an indu- like a domestic light beer, a Miller Lite, a Bud Light, a Coors Light, mm-hmm. uh, but they just have a little. They got more flavor. They got the flavor has mm-hmm. just been amped up tremendously. But it's something uh, that's and, familiar. It's exactly it okay. exactly. Uh, yeah. And so let's. So I think you start there. Start with what you know you like. Yep. Uh, and, and, and I'm not saying, like, I know I like IPAs. Be like, I know I like kind of this flavor of beer, so this is golden and clear, so let's let's start here, you know? Yep. And, and a lot of times uh, the, the beer on the bottles, too, will tell you the flavors that they have. Absolutely. And now, So you can even you know metric- you like something that's fruity or sour, they're going to tell you on the bottle that it's fruity and sour. Right. Okay. And that's just wanna... a marketing thing, I assume, that they're just good it's at. It's smart because okay. you don't want to buy beer thinking you're getting a porter and all of a sudden you end up with a Goza or something. Yeah. <laughs> yeah you know, wow. exactly. You want to know what you're getting. Um, you know, so, so usually they will kind of tell you what kind of style it is and so, they will tell you some of the main flavors. But I could just go there. It, it sounds like what you're saying is that the, the beer families are close enough that I could just go and literally just look at how clear a liquid is or the color of the liquid 
and be okay. Almost. To Sometimes, a certain degree, yeah. yeah. yeah to a certain degree, okay. yeah. I would say that as a general rule, a, very, a broad general rule, yeah, that, that would work. Interesting. If you know you like beers that are brown, yeah, drink brown beer. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, you know, I think that's a, on a very basic level, you could totally do just that. Whereas mm-hmm. some things like wine, you really can't, like a red wine can be a huge variety not of things. All, not all reds yeah. are created yeah. equal. Okay. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And I mean, you're going to get, let's just keep with the golden beer example, because yeah, that's sure. what we're talking Perfect. about. Um, you know, you can go from everywhere from a Miller Lite mm-hmm. to a, uh, like a triple IPA, uh, that let's say a Miller Lite is four and a half, five percent alcohol, very clear. It's very, you know, you know exactly what it tastes like mm-hmm. to this thing that is going to taste like pine resin and <laughs> while, and, and, and it tastes and it be 12% alcohol. Do you know yeah. what I mean? Uh, yeah. It's a huge difference just in that. Uh, uh-huh. So, but start with what you like. That's the, the, when I talk to people about what they want to brew or what beer they want to drink or anything like that. It is absolutely start with what you like. Yeah. Um, so, and, and then, then go from there. And yeah. Then, and then, so... I mean, then you get down to the nitty gritty. So mm-hmm. okay, if, yeah, if you are a that. person that you don't like IBUs, you don't like bitterness, mm-hmm. um, then something with 60 IBUs is going to be probably too bitter for you. Okay. And, and yeah, what, what's the range there? Like, I, I mean, typically what you see is from zero to probably about 70. Okay. Anything above seventy, and you're starting to get into like the really kind of crazy. And there's only so much you can perceive for bitterness too. Could you place some common? But like, could you place some common ones on there, on that scale? All right. So like, I would say if you had like a Miller High Life, it's <laughs> it's IBU is probably going to be like one or two. Okay. Um, yeah. And then, but if you're looking at like a Bell's Two Hearted, I think their IBU is around fifty or okay. four, between forty and fifty. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it, and that's a that's a big range. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I'm looking I'm looking up right now to see if I can. Yeah. What what is the bell? Yeah. To see if I can find like a an IBU range. Um, and let's see. So like a Belgian um, fat tire. Yeah. You know, that, fat that's tire, something most people it's have like seen. A, it's a it's a tw- it's it's IBU unit. It's, it's 22. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and that's pretty while, common for uh, a lot of things like that. While a dogfish head 60 minute IPA is an IBU of 90. Yeah. Uh, okay. Sierra Nevada Pale Ale is 38. Um, okay. So. All right. So that gives you, and like, yeah. There. And like Miller Lite, yeah, stuff like that. They're going to run in the, like, the 5 to 10 range, probably. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. Something like that. You know. Yeah. Typically, the lower, the lower you have, I mean, it's. I, and IBUs, it's, it's important to understand, too, that that's just perceived bitterness. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. So, you know, when, 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 well, excuse me, it's not, it's not perceived bitterness is what I'm saying. Um, when, when we think of what you can perceive, there are other factors that play a role in that other than alpha acids. Okay. So something can have a lower, like you could have an IBU of 30, but it will feel hoppier than it is. Interesting. Is that just the amount of sugar in it or what? No, it's just, it's other components. So there are other things other like when we talk about bitterness, bitterness, uh, those units are derived only from alpha acids, but there are other components of hops that can add bitterness. Even mm-hmm. some of the different types of malts that you use can add a bitterness. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, that perception matters too. Okay, cool. Yeah. Well, hops have hops can have so many flavors within them mm-hmm. uh, that it can change how stuff. I mean, there are hops with very fruity notes to them that mm-hmm. that's going to sort that sweet fruitiness is going to cut the bitterness on mm, yep. okay. there are some that are sort of resinous or piney uh uh dank uh that are gonna <laughs> and, that and are, those ones are going to seem a lot more bitter they're going to seem a lot more bitter exactly i mean okay. uh hops and uh yeah it's that simple i mean hops and marijuana are uh cousins <laughs> and so they are and so yeah, no, the, no. The, the, the the on that dankier sort of weedy end of uh hops is where you're going to get a lot of uh even perceived bitterness even yep. though they're even if the ibus aren't that high yeah uh, funky so yeah yeah exactly um so and and like, like once again alcohol they're they're agricultural products yep yep they're um, the range of what they can do is uh, is 
another huge. thing I have on the bottle, or, or that you see on the bottle, is is ABV, which is the alcohol content by volume. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, that, that tells you, that, you know, that will give you a flavor too. What so, else does that tell me other than literally how much alcohol is in this thing? What is the flavor change going to be with that? A lot. So a twelve percent beer mm-hmm. typically going to feel a lot warmer. And like when we talk about warm, it's like, you know, if you drink like a whiskey. Mm-hmm. And, and you drink it, you know, you get that warm feeling. Mm-hmm. So some beers will give you that mm-hmm. at a higher ABV. Um, lower beers don't typically do that. So we, we think of low ABV, so four and under as being kind of sessionable, what which is, means that, that word? we call them lawnmower beers. <laughs> those, those are beers that you can drink all day long. I see. And, and mm-hmm. what was the word you used for that? Sessionable. Is that a, is that a real term? A session or beer. Yeah, like session that? beers. Session yep. beers is uh, is the, um, where that's coming from. It, uh, it's basically when you have a style that is lower alcohol content. Okay. So like you can have an IPA that has a ABV of four, you know, to five. That's considered sessionable because a lot of I, a lot of IPAs have alcohol contents of seven to eight. Okay. Mm-hmm. It's just beers that are much more drinkable. Okay. Uh, yeah. in, in volume. Do you know yeah. what I mean? Like yeah. Um, so, so and, and you know, the rule of thumb is like usually the higher up you go in that, the more warmth you're going to feel. Okay. Um, that's not always the case, but it, it can. There are some styles that can have very high, uh, very high uh, ABVs to them and not feel boozy. Okay, mm-hmm. so and that was like my a, other question. What are the other yeah. flavors I'm getting out of that? Is there also like mouthfeel changes or anything like that? Mouthfeel is one, yep. Mm-hmm. Um, and what's that going to Well, it's just a. Again, it's a warmth kind of flavor, or like if we describe things as being fusel, mm-hmm. like if it's fusel, it tastes solventy. You know, it, mm-hmm. it tastes like ethanol. It doesn't. It's not a. We don't normally think of it as being super pleasant. It's a warmth, but the, it's not necessarily a pleasant warmth. Okay. It's like a. Bar- it's it's you know if you if you're like me and you snuck uh, drinks of your dad's scotch out of his bottle when you were like 15, <laughs> um, you know you would. You would don't take be a like swig that, of kids. it. Yeah, don't be like that kid. Uh, yep. You'll end up like me. Uh, but <laughs> you, t- you, you take a swig of that bottle and it just burns. Do you know what yep. I mean? Like, and you're like, yeah. why do people drink this? Yep. Um, but you know, and so, and that is on the extreme end because you're talking about like, you know, eight seventy percent alcohol or yeah. whatever. On, on the beer end, you're going to get like. Uh, for example, like your session beers, your Miller Lights, all that stuff. You know, you can just drink it; and it tastes like beer. But once you get to like ten, eleven percent, it, it is going to ch- it's going to change the whole dynamic of that beer. It's going to be a lot warmer when you drink it in your throat and in your stomach. Uh, it uh, the mouthfeel will definitely be different. It's going to have a little bigger mouthfeel um, okay. and stuff like that. So yeah, there's I mean the ABV and just and ABV is sort of um, um, when I first started drinking craft beer, I would drink it like I was drinking Miller. Lite. And so when you drink an eight percent beer, but you drink six of them, like you would drink six Bud, <laughs> Bud Lights or something, your whole that's gonna it's a big difference. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> so be careful, folks. Yeah, yeah. So be careful. By yeah. all means. They they said that eight percent beer is the same as drinking two of the. <laughs> Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yep. So, that's a good thing. And just for uh, equivalency on mm-hmm. ABV, wine is where? Wine is usually runs around uh, between nine and eighteen percent, depending yep. on the wine. Okay. Uh, but it's usually around. I think it's usually around fifteen percent. It usually sort of sits in that middle fifteen percent range. Okay. Twelve, fifteen, yep. something like that. And uh, mead and ciders. Uh, ciders tend to be a bit higher. They they run from anywhere from like five to yeah about twelve. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, and then meads they they get even higher than that. So meads are going to be more like wine. So it's not uncommon for a mead to have like a fifteen percent. Okay. Yeah, mead can get mead can really get up there because it's pure sugar. Yeah, that's true. It can really uh, go nuts. I just looked at some wine bottles in my cellar, and yeah, they're like. Fifth. They're all around the twelve to seventeen percent range. Mm-hmm. Okay. So. Yeah, that's cool. Um, I just wanted to give the comparison there. Mm-hmm. Um, do any craft brewers just like shoot for stupid numbers on either those IBUs or ABUs? Not in well, 
some did. In the past, you'd have people seeing how many IBUs they could put into a beer. But again, perception is an issue. So at some point, you can't perceive any more bitterness. Yeah. And so once you hit that threshold, different. anything above that is just wasting money. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Kind of like salt mm-hmm. is just at a certain point, mm-hmm. it's just salt. Uh, yeah. that's, a, that's, a great, that's a great analogy of salt. Okay. That's a really yeah. good one. Uh, when it comes to IBUs and, and alcohol, uh, once you hit over a certain level of alcohol, you're no longer technically a beer. Yeah, uh, really. And so, yeah. Well, and there uh, there are oftentimes limits to that. So, like in Alabama, for example, you can only produce a beer as high as twelve point nine nine percent. Interesting. If you produce a beer over that, you're no longer producing beer, and then you're in trouble. What is it? What does it call? Is there a name for that, or is it just wine at that point? Malt it's liquor, baby. Malt liquor. <laughs> oh, really? That's what malt liquor is. <laughs> Yeah, malt liquor is uh, just a really high ABV beer. It yeah, tastes I, like beer, it looks like beer, but it's like 13%. I had no idea that that's what that, that was. I thought it was some bizarre industrial process. Oh, it is. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but uh, it's just, it's following the same sort of principle as beer, of uh, beer brewing. I mean, it really is. But, it's just uh, nuclear. They're, just, they're cranking out those yeah. ABVs so that you get the most bang for your buck. Okay, I um, had no idea. I hope that that's uh, informative for everybody because I had no idea that that's what that was. It's the same thing with like Smirnoff Ice and Zima and all that stuff. They're all technically liquors. Um, Interesting. Bizarre. Okay. That's strange. <laughs> um, so while we're on the topic you... of, of labels and styles and stuff sure. like that, um, one can... Do either of you, I, I don't really just want to have you guys like wrap out a list of beers, but is there a good place that people should go to find a list of styles? Yeah, the, the BJCP. There you go, Clark. Uh, so, yeah, so there is an organization, the BJCP, okay. uh, which gives it all for the... the it stands yeah. for the Beer Judge Certification Program. Okay. Yep. And you can go to their website and they give you all the different styles. Mm-hmm. And so when you look up the styles, and they'll give subtypes of the styles as well, Mm -hmm. and they give you all the different things you want to know. So it will tell you the color. And they they give it in something called SRM, right, which is, you know, low numbers are light, higher you go, darker gets. But the SRMs, a lot of times, they'll also show you the scale, the color of it, and describe it. Oh, that's cool. So um, they'll they'll give a description of what it looks like, uh, what it tastes like. Um, any of the sort of characteristics that set it apart from other styles. Interesting. Um, you know, bitterness. Cool. The, the, a lot of times they'll even tell you what types of hops are used and what types of grain. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, so it gives you, I mean, it's really informative. And, and it is. It's uh, That program and, and those standards are used to judge beers. Okay. And for yep. those people at home, um, if you Google BJCP, it's the first thing that comes up. But it is also mm-hmm. BJCP.org uh, is mm-hmm. their website. Uh, yep. yep. Uh, well, here's. I'll give you an example. I'm, I'm looking at their website right now, and this is uh, International Pale Ale. Uh, the overall impression of an International Pale Ale is a highly attenuated pale lager without strong flavors, typically well balanced and highly carbonated. It's served cold. It is refreshing and thirst quenching. So that's a I good mean, description. That's a really solid yeah. description. Yeah, I like mm-hmm. that. So your Heineken, uh, 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 Corona. Asahi, all those, a red stripe, uh, those all fit into that description. Oh, I mean, cool. So okay. you, know, awesome. you know exactly what that beer tastes like. Yep. Yeah, and I mean, they will, they'll tell you the different beers that are representative a lot of times. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, it's part of the, uh, yep. uh, they have a beer guideline list, that's what I'm looking at, and every one of them will have um, an American light lager, highly carbonated, very light-bodied, nearly flavorless, uh, designed to be consumed very cold, very refreshing, mm-hmm. and thirst quenching. Mm-hmm. Bud Light, yeah. Coors Light, Keystone, whatever. Um, cool. All right. So for those folks at home that want specific descriptions, that looks like a really great place to get it's short, a, it, concise. Yeah, it's a great place. wonderful resource. Yeah. Um, there's also a great, if you're looking to really sort of get into learning more and more about beer, there's a wonderful book called The Oxford Companion to Beer. Mm-hmm. Or the Oxford Beer Companion, something like that. Um, and it is sort of a dictionary uh, it, it's, it's set up like an encyclopedia, essentially. So you can look up cities, you can look up different breweries, you can look up different brewery terms, stuff like that, and it'll give you break different beer styles, and it will give you a really nice, really, it's a really good resource. Cool, uh, yeah, that's good. So, um, 
All right, let, let's uh, talk a little bit about home brewing specifically, because uh, I think that that's something that people, either their friends are doing it or, or they're mm -hmm. interested in doing it or they've had a bottle of it before. Um, I think the first thing and the most important thing from uh, the standpoint of it just being good, uh, what defines success and failure for a homebrew? I imagine failures have much more definitive failures than the successes. Um, I mean, on its most basic level, um, I would say success is, does it taste good? Yep. Okay. Uh, failure is it tastes bad. Yep. Uh, that I mean, on its on a, on a very basic level. And if you're only looking to make beer that tastes good, or and not make beer that tastes bad, that's a totally fine metric to use. Okay. Uh, totally acceptable. I mean, home brewing is uh, an interesting hobby in that you can you could go as far into it as you want to and still be producing good beer. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like, you can mm -hmm. bog down in all the science you want to. You can do all those things and hit all these num have all these numbers that you want to hit, and it still be good. Or you can just be like, "Yeah, we just made this beer to taste good, so that we keep doing it." Yep, yep. The one I did last and, time and, was fine, so I'm to do it again. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, you know, like it, the, and then you'll see some folks that take it to the other end, where to them a failure is: does it adhere to style or not? Exactly. Oh, Absolutely. If it, yeah. if it is not adhering to style, it's a failure. It could be a mm -hmm. perfectly drinkable beer. It could be a delicious but they're beer. Started with like with the BJCP. Think of this mm -hmm. as being within style. These are our Westminster show dogs that have floppy ears. Absolutely. Exactly. Yeah. Absolutely. Yep. <laughs> um, that th th this dog analogy, man. I'm going to start using. This. <laughs> Good. Uh, I like it. <laughs> because it's very. I mean, it's very true. When you're judging, like if they're judging beer, if you're judging homebrew or whatever beer if you're judging beer you're judging it as it adheres to the style guidelines okay. not necessarily it's the best tasting beer yeah, uh, okay. yeah. it is what most adheres to the guidelines uh yeah. you that, can have a great so, tasting beer that does poorly on a mm -hmm. judge sheet because of style interesting mm -hmm. okay that if you sense. submit a pilsner they're expecting this 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 and that. yep yeah and if it doesn't hit those it's not a pilsner okay uh it still could be delicious um, and something you're really proud of, but it's not necessarily going to win a best Pilsner award. Okay. Um, does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, it definitely mm -hmm. does. Um, and I assume that there are some things that are abject failures that are actually, uh, problems. And I think that this might mm -hmm. be a Clark thing. Um, mm -hmm. if I'm doing this at home and I don't want to die, what am I looking for? <laughs> well, you probably won't die. Okay. Unless you're doing really crazy stuff. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> the, you might have an upset the, stomach, but dying is a bit extreme. Okay. Yeah. You know, I mean, even getting sick from beer is a bit of a challenge. Um, the reason is just because of the environment that beer has. Mm -hmm. It's so just built for it's, decontaminating. It's a, it's a low pH environment. Um, most bacteria that are pathogenic don't tolerate a very low pH. And low pH is acidic. Yep. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, it is a it, it is an oxygen free environment, and most pathogens are you know don't do so hot in a you know oxygen free environment. Mm -hmm. um, it is a nutrient poor environment because especially if you have good yeast growth, if the, if the yeast are growing really really well. They're going to utilize almost all the sugar. They're eating. They're eating everything. Yeah. Oh, so you're just using the yeast to starve out yep. everything else. Exactly. Oh, it's okay. a it's a competition. Okay. So it's a little ecosystem. Um, and then on top of that, you also have you know the production of alcohol as a byproduct. Yeah, and mm -hmm. alcohol kills. Um, and lots again, of stuff. a lot of bacteria can't tolerate alcohol very well. Mm -hmm. um, you you look at so like when we think about making beer, it's important to understand it's not a sterile process. Uh, what that means is that. You know, even at the end of the process, there are going to be some unwanted little dudes hanging out in your beer mm -hmm. or in your wart. Um, the thing is, is that what you're doing is you're trying to overwhelm them. So, oh, you know, I think of it from like, you know, if you think of like a, a bar or something and you have like, <laughs> you know, folks showing up with all their friends yeah. and they take mm -hmm. over all the seats. Yep. Well, if they take over all the seats, you're not getting service. I see. Yeah. So these little guys that are in small numbers just can't compete with them. That makes mm -hmm. sense. Um, so they, they, they become overwhelmed pretty quick. Okay, and that's cool. why we, we, we refer to brewing as a sanitary process, but not a sterile process. Okay. Um, 
So real hard failure is difficult. Well, it's not that difficult. It's, <laughs> real hard all failure obvious. is due to, yeah, I mean, you can easily kill a beer, um, but it's usually due to, you know, a considerable amount of inattention to detail. Okay. So if you're not cleaning your buckets or cleaning the things that are going to come in contact mm-hmm. with the, the chilled wart, um, that's a problem. What is that going to um, look like or taste like? Oh, there's all kinds of stuff. It could taste... Dude, all... it is such a range. It's crazy. <laughs> okay, yeah. all right. Then we won't get into it. <laughs> You'll know. It won't taste right. Um, you, I mean, you can... I mean, you, you're, you're talking about flavors that go from sewer gas Ooh. to uh, uh, metallic oh. to, to, like, apple. To just apple or... Yeah, I mean... Uh, or yogurt. <laughs> or, yeah, yeah, yogurt. Will but now, wouldn't something like apple be a desirable thing to... Sometimes, okay. but not generally. All right. mm-hmm. um, and, and usually it's not desirable if it is due to um, infection. Okay. Right? Yeah. So we think of that, that kind of apple flavor is due to acetaldehyde. Mm-hmm. And usually you, you get that as a – it's kind of a byproduct of an unfinished fermentation. So, mm-hmm. so when we think of it, when we go to make beer, we start off with sugar, mm-hmm. like a simple sugar like glucose. And the first thing that the yeast is going to do is, in, in fermentation, it's going to convert that glucose to acetaldehyde. Mm-hmm. And that acetaldehyde has that apple flavor. Okay. Then what will happen is it will convert that acetaldehyde into ethanol and carbon dioxide. And okay. so like if you see like a, you know, a partial fermentation taking place, there's going to be those kind of apple flavors. So like for me, when I do brewing, I sample, I try to sample daily during the process to see where things are going along mm-hmm. and initially i'll have kind of a little bit of a sour apple flavor mm-hmm. but it cleans up because it's, i see it's because still they the finish their the metabolism yeah mm-hmm. okay yeah that makes mm-hmm. good sense cool yeah. so um, you get a whole a variety of... of failures apparently yeah oh yeah um but all of them are due by and large all of your failures in home brewing are due to co- some sort of contamination okay yep. Uh, yep. and almost all of them can be pre- almost can be prevented by I mean, cleanliness is next to godliness in Berlin. Yep, uh, yeah. um, you just got to keep your stuff clean and be very deliberate about cleaning and sanitizing. And now can I um, leave it out on the porch or in the sun to warm up to get up to temperature or no? No. If you want to. <laughs> well, I went, not, unless, <laughs> not unless it's a closed system. Right. So if you, if you leave it out there open to the air. You're going to get more um, stuff in there. Yeah. But mm-hmm. the other thing is typically in Alabama, the issue isn't keeping it warm the issue keeping is keeping it cool, it cool. Yeah. Mm-hmm. uh but will sunlight damage it, it, it well if it's clear it will yep. yeah oh so if sunlight it's clear, and it's and clear. yeah that yeah. makes sense yeah so yeah. if you if you had hops for example mm-hmm. right one of the uh one of the things that can happen is sunlight causes the degradation of uh some hop oils okay. and what that does is creates a skunky flavor Ew. so if you think of like for example corona which corona is the prime bottle, example of it yep is we associate with Corona skunkiness. Yeah, because it's um, got the clear. That's bottle. an off flavor. That's not. It's it but it's part such, of. <laughs> but it's part of what that beer is. Yeah. Yeah, their skunkiness really is. I mean, it is when they can their beer, they actually uh, add some of that skunky flavor to it, so it tastes. So Corona tastes the same every time you get it. Weird. Um, same way on kegs and kegs. Um, yeah, Clark, you did a little science experiment about that a while mm-hmm. back. Uh, do you want to yeah. just really quickly cover that? Because I think it was yeah. interesting. So, you know, I wanted to kind of look to see whether or not folks would be able to tell the difference between Corona in a can and Corona in the bottle. Um, and when I chose Corona in the bottle, I chose clear bottles um, because mm-hmm. there that allows for sunlight to enter. And if you go to a, um, a grocery store, you'll notice that if it's a six pack, the six pack isn't covered and it sits under fluorescent lights almost all day long. Mm-hmm. Um, because of that, it's you know, over time, it's converting those hop oils into that kind of skunky flavor. Mm-hmm. And the cans, however, are closed. And yeah. so I brought them back and did um, a, a little test. It's basically you use three samples. Two of the samples are the same and one is different. And you have to determine which samples are the same. And you randomize it uh, okay. for the individuals. And eventually, if you collect enough data, you can see if there's a true difference. Mm-hmm. And I had enough people um, that were sampling that when we did this um, and we looked at it, it was very clear that there is a difference in flavor from the 
you know, the canned Corona and then the, the clear Corona and the, the clear, clear bottle Corona. And, and it wasn't looking for you weren't looking for which one tastes better or which one tastes worse or anything nope. like that. Just which you were just, just looking just is, is there a difference? Yeah. 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 So I, I, and when I did this test, I wasn't telling you to look for uh, odor. I wasn't telling mm-hmm. you to look for color. Um, I wasn't telling you to look for taste. Just different. It was just, is it different? Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's cool. What, what two are the same and which one's different? And that's, and that's the only way you approach it because otherwise you start guiding people to making those. If I said, well, what about the odor? Yeah, then right. guide it's people, easy and then I would figure it out. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But for the most part, most people were able to tell the the two apart. Most mm-hmm. being fifty percent or seventy percent, uh, seventy five or more. That's impressive. Yeah, for yeah. Mm-hmm. what we would consider a relatively small difference in something. Yeah. Um, and speaking of cans and bottles, um, there is a there's a lingering myth about cans that that beer in a bottle tastes better than beer in a can, and at mm-hmm. one time. When that cans true, were made of steel, yeah. that was yeah. that was completely true. Now the bot the can is the way to go, yep. if you can find it. Uh, it is a completely closed system. The cans have different liners in them that do not impart any sort of flavor. Uh, it's essentially a mini keg at this point. Mm-hmm. Uh, so if you're looking, if if you have the option to buy a beer that you really like in a can, I would recommend going can over bottle. Um, yep. Okay, just for that UV so, safety thing. Mm-hmm. Well, okay. strip, yep. that's that, a big part uh, of it. That's a big part of it, but also uh, uh, cap the the crowns on top of bottles, the caps mm-hmm. uh, are made of steel. They can rust and impart flavor. Okay. Uh, um, the the reason people bottle more is that it's so much cheaper to bottle your beer than it is to mm-hmm. can your beer. Really, I would have figured that mm-hmm. would be the other way around. Nope. Well, more than anything, it's the equipment you have to get. To Bottle oh, okay. and can. Canning lines are very expensive. Bottling lines, not nearly. Okay, okay, that makes sense. So for smaller when, when producers, we look at their, when we mm-hmm. look at it now, there is a big push for breweries to get canning lines, um, mm-hmm. and and there's a sustainability as, aspect to that. Um, yes, it's actually yeah. easier to recycle aluminum cans than it is to recycle glass. Yeah, by a lot. Uh, glass has to get segregated by its color. Well, and um, it's just weighs yeah. a lot, so moving it to it a recycling a lot, plant it's, is not it's a easy. problem. And whereas the cans are much easier, yep. and it can be. I don't. Recycled I don't pretty. know if there is a glass recycler in the United States anymore. It takes so much energy to recycle glass. Yeah, that a I don't lot know of about up here, overseas. but I do know um, down in um, Tallahassee they would not recycle glass. There was, there was, they yeah. did segregate mm-hmm. it. Like they, they did put it in a big pile yeah. just in mm-hmm. case it ever became recyclable. But mm-hmm. um, yeah, the glass was not recycled. Uh, it is so expensive to do. That's why yeah. they don't do it. I don't think they do it in Mag- Montgomery. Uh, no, no, I don't think they do either. It's um, just, uh, so there is that. Crazy. Okay. So uh, the so, prices, the price of canning lines is coming down considerably. So uh, cans just, are better guys at home. Yep. Cans are better. Yep. Mm-hmm. All right. Mm-hmm. Interesting. So, um, so while we're talking about homebrew and doing that and, and doing that yeah, kind yeah, of yeah, thing, sorry, yeah, um, no, 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 it's fine, it's fine. We we got off on a tangent. That was a good tangent. <laughs> um, uh, with talking about how specific these flavors are and how apparently people can tell the difference between a bottle that has UV damage and one that doesn't. Um, mm-hmm. How possible is it to reverse engineer a recipe? Like, say, Clark, you made something great, you lose the recipe, you don't remember what you put in it. Can you work backwards? Sometimes. Um, it depends on the style. So normally what would happen is the styles use certain per, uh, proportions of grain. Mm-hmm. Um, and they use different types of grain. So, for example, if I'm using, if I'm making a, a pale ale, mm-hmm. I'm going to use a lot of two-row. Um, I'm not going to use chocolate malt. Which is a, t- which is a type of malt. Yeah. <laughs> yes, yep. thank you. Uh, if, if, I'm, if I'm making a Pilsner, I'm going to use Pilsner malt. Mm-hmm. Um, so a lot of times, just based on style, you know exactly what types of grains you want to work with. Mm-hmm. Um, and then any of the other grains that you add can are, are usually added to give a little bit of flavor or give a little bit of color. And so because you know what the grains look like and you know the kind of flavors they impart, mm-hmm. um, You'll avoid some or use others. Uh-huh. Your your hops also give you specific flavors too. So if I'm ending, you know, if I'm looking for a kind of a citrusy hop, you know, I might go citra. 
with that. If, if my beer was citrusy, I'm not mm. going to go with something that was piney, for example. Oh, okay. Um, so you you do you are capable of kind of working back. It it might not be exactly. It's gonna the same, it's gonna be but... hard to. It, it would be difficult to taste a beer knowing nothing about it, and then be yep. like work backwards from that. But if you have a basic understanding of what that beer is, you could totally do it. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, um, so if you so, had that labelless bottle in the bottom of the cooler, that might be an issue. Mm-hmm. Okay. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. All right. And let's talk a little bit about what another aspect of what grain does to your beer. Speak. This is what Clark talking about two row and Pilsner. Yeah. The color of the beer comes from the grain. Yeah. Uh, okay, I know cool. there are a lot of people who say that like dark beers have more alcohol. Dark beers are stronger. This and the other. That's nonsense. That obviously makes no uh, sense because vodka is perfectly yeah. clear. Right. Well, exactly. But <laughs> there are a lot of people who will drink, you know, and sometimes now darker beers with their chocolatey, coffee, roasty flavors can stand up. Those flavors can stand up to higher to a higher alcohol content. Oh, that makes mm-hmm. sense. Yeah. Uh, they can they can stand up to that alcohol flavor. So a lot of times they do have more alcohol. But the only thing that determines the color of your beer is the color of the grain that's used. And that's how much it's been toasted, essentially, right? That is how much yeah. it's been toasted, okay. absolutely. Well, and yep. I'm, I'm referring to, to dark that. beers there, as toasted beers actually, from now on. You can, you can there change you go. color a little bit by boil time, too. Well, yeah, 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 yeah. And that's like but, making tea, So the longer right? you boil it, the more concentrated yeah. it gets, okay. the darker yeah. it gets. And you also mm-hmm. get more uh, Maillard reactions. Okay. Right. Yeah. And Maillard but, reactions but, are the conversions of sugars into a bunch of other stuff by heat. Yeah, it's like the... the when you have like sugars and proteins interacting yeah, and it causes like a, it's like when you think of like browning butter, yeah. that's a Maillard reaction. Searing a steak. Yes. Yep. Um, anything like that. And, and, but primarily like your color is going to come from your grains. Okay. But cool. yeah, I, if I, if I have a very light beer and I boil it for 90 minutes, it would be darker than if I boiled it for 30 minutes. And, and since yeah. we came back to it, I just, I, just for didn't think about it that color there another thing that we think about when we think about color is opacity or clarity mm-hmm. i don't know what you mm-hmm. guys use what what term yep, is used one and um what what makes one one way and another a different way we we have clarity and okay. for most people clarity is a big thing um so we the non when we have non-clear beer we refer to haziness okay right and there are different types of haze so there's non-biological haze and then biological haze um, that sounds gross. Biological haze, new band name, I call it. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, you know, the biological haze would be due to things like, you know, contaminants, like bacteria or whatnot, uh, microorganisms that are growing in the beer. Mm-hmm. Um, the non biological haze could be due to uh, different components in the beers that are interacting mm-hmm. uh, that, have it, that need to be removed. Okay, um, so is one of those things okay and one of them not? Or is it just, again, a style guide thing? Or? Typically, if you have contamination, that's not. Okay. Um, and, and but haziness, yeah. haziness is absolutely a style guide. It's important. For some beer. Yeah, oh, okay. Yep. It is important. Some beers are... Uh, pils, pilsners are made to be clear. Yep. Uh, Crystal okay. clear. Yeah. Uh, if you have a hazy pilsner, you have really screwed up. Yeah. Okay. Uh, IPAs can be hazy. There's a whole section of, like, hazy IPAs. Yeah. Saisons, house beers... They could be cloudy uh, or hazy. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, it, they're, different styles have different clarity guidelines. Okay, and, cool. and, you know, the, the thing to point out from a homebrew kind of situation here is that haziness is a little bit hard to control. A lot of our beers are going to get what we call chill haze. So, for example, when I pour out an IPA that I have on draft at my house um, that I made, I don't filter my beer. Mm-hmm. So, you know, there's, there's going to be those proteins and whatnot. And... At colder temp, they come out of solution, and, that's and they cause them. it to be hazy. Okay. Mm-hmm. So, like, if I look at it, it, doesn't have good clarity. But if I let that beer sit and warm up for, you know, fifteen minutes, mm-hmm. it disappears. They go back into solution. Okay. So that's a you know a chill haze is is kind of acceptable haze. It's mm-hmm. it's you know judging it wouldn't be great, but it's not a deal breaker. But then mm-hmm. there's like if it's a hazy that doesn't go away. That's probably and not it's good. not supposed to be there, then that's a big problem. Oh, okay. But usually commercial breweries, they, they get around it by filtering and by using finings. 
and mm-hmm. findings just drops everything out of solution, right? Yep. It it yeah. just they bind their like magnets. Yeah. You can think mm-hmm. of it as being molecular magnets, and they just grab onto all these other things and drop them out. <laughs> just float to the sink to the bottom. Yeah. Yep. <clears throat> okay, well, that's pretty good. Um, I think that the the one big question I would like to ask of both of you is kind of um what are you guys personally doing in the near future? Um, and what would you like, especially Clark, because you're a weird biologist person, mm-hmm. um, what are you guys looking for in the far future for this stuff? Are we going to start seeing weird engineered kinds of yeast and things like that? Or is that way, way out or what? Well, you know, engineering yeast, um, that is, that's kind of been a discussion, but that becomes an issue too, depending on where, what market you're selling it in. Uh, a lot of folks, are really they're hesitant with engineered yeast although that that's been things that we've looked at um, so now that we have CRISPR technology mm-hmm. um, we could very easily add different genes into the yeast genome it's it's a pretty simple genome to work with so if you got um, carte blanche on that what would what would you like to see well for example one of the things that has been discussed is it would be good to engineer yeast that maybe have hot flavors Mm-hmm. So rather than using hops, uh, now you, your yeast is providing those different flavors, and the the reason for that is because you know hops are expensive to grow. It's an agricultural process. Uh, with climate change, the the range of areas that they can grow is decreasing. Oh, okay. um, so it's a, it's an adaptation to our changing environment, um, and it's also to try to make this a more sustainable process. That um, sounds like good important work. It is, but you know, it's it's a hard sell still. Yeah. Um, it, you know, people are uncomfortable with that kind of technology, and you know, it's it's unclear as to whether it's all going to be kind of the same. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, the other thing would be to engineer yeast to break down different kinds of uh, sugars. So, yeah. for example, most yeast they can break down uh, glucose, which is a simple sugar. They can mm-hmm. break down sucrose, which is table sugar. Yeah. Um, you know, and they could do. You know, fructose, which is you know sugar that you find in fruits, uh, but they can't break down lactose. Ah, okay. So like you could um, take milk and yeah. So you can't really ferment milk with your standard yeast. Interesting. Uh, but that might be you could you could engineer a, a yeast to have the genes necessary that produce the enzymes that break down lactose. Now, could you break down something like cellulose? With yeast, yeah. uh, they they typically don't break down cellulose. Okay, Did but, that be, is that know, is that within the that range could be, of engineering? You could do that if you could put in um, cellulase. Yeah, you could probably get them to break that down. Interesting. That's um, cool. So we can look at engineering. I mean, yeast are uh, yeast because of their genome are, are pretty easy to work with, and they are they're kind of uh, they're a microbial guinea pig. Cool. <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> yeah, that's a good way to look at it. I like that. Um, so that sounds like a good range of things to do with them, breaking down mm-hmm. different sugars and getting flavors that are otherwise expensive to get. Um, mm-hmm. And what about near future? I know, Clark, you're working with... Uh, are you allowed to talk about that? Um, yeah. Okay, sure. go. Uh, so, so, yeah, so what are you doing in the next year or so? Uh, so for me right now, uh, one of the big things is I'm working on uh, building a uh, brewing program at uh, AUM. Mm-hmm. And so part of this process and what we're planning on doing is over the summer, I'm, I'm going to be building a brewery on campus. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, so we're going to have our own little brewery. It'll be a small scale, um, couple, couple barrel brewery. Um, and the idea is to train students how to use the equipment and get them to understand the industrial in, you know processes of this. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I'm, I'm set to teach a course in fermentation this fall. And so I know with that right now, I have my lectures are going to be, it's a, it's a hybrid course, mm-hmm. uh, which means that the lecture component will be online. And so I'll produce my PowerPoints, produce my, yeah, cool. my recorded lectures. And then Fridays, um, which is normally an off day at AUM, we'll have the lab and it's a long lab. It's I think four or five hours. Oh, that's and nice. that's to learn the brewing process and working in yeah, the brewery. In that lab. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, cool. So we, we're using this as more of a lab kind of situation. Um, it, a lot of it is, you know, when I think about this this brewing certificate that we're working towards, um, you know, it's it's to build skills in the brewing industry so that way, you know, we're, we're creating folks that are hireable. 
Yeah. Yeah. That's and in good. the in the long run, and in the yep. long term for that, Clark, you want to actually be able to turn this into a a brewing science major. So you're not only doing the fermentation and the mm-hmm. science and the practical stuff, but also business classes. That would be really yep. great. Yeah, um, yeah, things like idea. that. So you can graduate yeah. from AUM with a brewing science degree. And so you're ready to rock. Yeah. So, I mean, like right now, I mean, if we look at the certificate and some of the stuff that I, what I'm proposing, you know, we're definitely the business is a big part of it. We have a lot of folks that, um, you know, when they, they are home brewers, but we're not businessmen. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. So it's yeah, hard to under, it's very hard to open up a brewery and to understand the financial implications of doing such. Well, first uh, of all, opening a brewery is very expensive. It's yeah. very expensive. <laughs> well, and on that topic, Clark, you're working with one of the breweries here in town, right? Yep. Um, yep. So I've been I've been working down at uh, Common Bond Brewery. Okay. At Brewers. So um, been helping them out, uh, learning the different brewing process, working on their equipment. Um, the head brewer and I, uh, Andrew McNally, we worked on the you know done some really big batches of beer and then we worked on some smaller scale stuff um aum has a, a one barrel fermenter down there a unit tank mm-hmm. and so we've been brewing a lot of uh, experimental beers um cool. and i know that he's you know been um getting a lot of folks in the community interested in what he's doing mm-hmm. so they're coming in they're asking for hey we got this kind of cool event can you brew a beer for the event Ooh, that's um, neat. So he's been doing a lot of that, and I've been helping him out on that. Yeah, that's really cool. Yeah. Um, and, and then, so, so in the in the near future, what are you looking to make? Is there something something we should be on the lookout for? Well, you know, for me right now, I there's no beer I'm making uh, right now that's kind of a special one uh, there. Um, things that, as you might expect, have kind of slowed slowed down with yes. uh, what's yeah. going on. Um, of course. We're more or less just kind of keeping things moving, doing the, the big stuff. Yeah. I know that he is working on, and I'm going to help him with this brew day, a, a Tej beer. What is that? Um, it is a, a beer with honey in it. It's a Ooh. African kind of style. Hmm. Uh, it's almost awesome. like a mead, but it's, it's a beer mead combo. Um, and that's for um, you know the Montgomery Museum of Fine Arts. They're going to be Ooh. having an event. Oh, that's cool. Um, yep. So this is a that. beer meant for People that event. Yeah, that's that. awesome. Yeah. Um, so that's kind of the things that he's been doing and that we're going to be doing in the future that, you know, as long as these events are still occurring, we'll be making the beer. Well, that's awesome. <laughs> right. And, and that's really cool because you can make a small batch. Yeah. Um, and, you and, and, you know, we've made some, things. Yeah. And I mean, it's a very small batch. So when we talk about, you know, to, to give a sense of size, when I say a barrel, um, a barrel system. What that means is we're working with 31 gallons. Okay, so it's not a 55 gallon drum. No, okay, it's yeah. it's it's 31 gallons. Um, normally, when we do a a brew day, we do a double batch. We don't mm-hmm. fill it, so we're not doing a full 31 gallons in the fermenter. We're mm-hmm. n- normally doing about 20 gallons in there. Okay, and that gets us three, uh, basically like three three little kegs. Okay, that's what we get three or four kegs out of it. Um. You know, if they're five gallons each, depends on how efficient we are. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, for this event, that would be, you know, we are probably have three kegs that would be ready for that event. All right. And cool. so that's, you know, that's very different than working on the big scale. Uh, working oh, yeah. on the small scale is kind of, you know, it's kind of fun. It's more experimental. You get to really change things. Working on the big scale, it is, uh, it, it is industrial. Mm-hmm. Yes, yeah, definitely. You know, yeah, you got to learn. Like, it's a lot of it's automated. A lot of it is um, reading, you know, different pieces of equipment, um, understanding how water flows through a brewery, yeah. um, <laughs> being mm-hmm. careful about how water flows through, uh, flows yeah, through a brewery. Um, you know, you do a lot of work with chemicals that you know Not can nice. be hazardous, yeah. um, pressures that can be hazardous. So it, it's it, it's more like working in a factory when you're working at a commercial scale than it is. Uh, doing the homebrew. Homebrew yeah. is usually a little bit more relaxing. Um, it's a little bit more fun. It's cool. a hobby. Homebrew yeah. is it's a, a hobby. hobby. Yeah. Um, All right. And on that note, Bo, mm-hmm. far future, what product yeah. would you like to carry in your store? In your store that you don't now? Would it be a different kind of grain? Would it be it's one of these weird yeasts we were talking about? What would you like? Um. No. Those. I mean. Those would be cool, but there, there's really no grain or yeast that I can't get if I don't want it. Uh, if I want it, do you know what I mean? Okay, that's cool. Uh, I'm looking more at the, the 
homebrewing equipment is really coming along is coming a long way very quickly. Oh, uh, so that's what you ad- want from the future. <laughs> yeah, the advent of uh, Arduinos and Raspberry Pis and yeah. programmable automation that you could do at home is the homebrewing technology is jumping leaps and bounds every year. Great. Okay. So um, that sounds cool. Yeah. And so that's, I mean, there are, there, there are thing, there's a product now that I can't remember the name. Clark might know it, but it looks essentially like a bread maker mm-hmm. that mm-hmm. you put on your counter and it oh, just brews. You, the you Pica button, brew. Yeah. The Pica brew. Yep. Uh, it looks like you, a bread maker. And it just you does press a whole a button batch of beer. It, yeah. Yep, you just add the grains to it. You press the button. It does the whole job for you. That's hilarious. Mm-hmm. That's so yep. funny. And it, and it keeps track of it too. So it's actually yeah. pretty, it's interesting. So it will, it'll keep a log of what's going on. And so you can see where it is in the process and you can change it as needed. Oh, that's um, cool. Yeah. But it's, it's and you know, you produce probably, I think about a gallon yeah. of beer. I think that's right. Yeah. You know, which is not huge, but it's still like, you know, if you're wanting to brew a little bit and have something fun, it you lives do, on and your it's counter. actually, yeah, that's awesome. It yeah, lives on your exactly. Counter. Yeah. Size of a toaster. And you know, it's relatively affordable these days. Cool. Yeah, the, and the prices on all that stuff is coming down. They have these. They have these. Uh, when you're fermenting beer, like Clark was saying, you want it as a low system, so oxygen can't get in, yeah. light can't get in, but mm-hmm. CO2 has to go somewhere. Yeah. So you have what on your thing, what's called an airlock, which yeah. is just a piece of plastic with uh, some sanitizer or uh, vodka in it or anything that will yeah. just keep stuff out, but yeah. uh, keep stuff from coming in, but let gas release. Well, they now have airlocks that uh read the amount of gas output from uh uh the beer that you've put in there mm-hmm. that uh they read the fl- how fast it comes out the flow of it everything like that and it can calculate it will calculate your uh abv from it it will calculate all do all these sort of calculations just based on the uh Oh, that's cool. Release that's, of yeah. CO2. Because I guess mm-hmm. if you can measure one half of the metabolism, you can measure the other Ex- half. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Or you can calculate it's the a, other half, I should say. They've do, I mean, it, the technology in home brewing is really where is really kind of amazing what's happening. And uh, so yeah. what are you looking to do with the store in the next year or so? Are you looking to make anything? Are you looking to brew anything interesting? Are you looking to do anything? Uh, I mean, I, I brew at the store, keep stuff at the store. I'm not looking necessarily to start. I don't want to necessarily start a or anything like that yeah yeah no but uh years i mean uh part of our plan is to open a small bottle shop inside the brewery uh oh, maybe cool. do some growler and crowler fills things like that that's um uh, certainly the direction we're leaning towards more than production yeah yeah uh, uh, that sounds so. really cool yeah yeah and you can go great. by and talk to Bo whenever you want he's a captive Absolutely. audience that's uh, it's true <laughs> <laughs> yeah um, henderson homebrew we're at uh four 46 Coliseum Boulevard. Uh, we're just across the street from the Eastbrook flea market and stuff like that. Yeah, so. ju- just north of Atlanta, right? Mm-hmm. Or yep. Atl- Atlanta Highway. Sorry, guys. Yep. Um, yep. Yeah, just north of Atlanta. Yeah, no. Just north of Atlanta Highway. Uh, <laughs> um, Henderson, HendersonHomebrew.com uh, yeah. or on Facebook or, in, or, or the Gram. So. Cool. Awesome. Um, and then the last thing, Clark, you, uh, there's a website called free the hops. Would you talk about yep. that for just a minute? Sure. Uh, so I am actually, um, on the board of directors of free the hops. Um, and what this organization did, you know, to give you a little bit of history is seven years ago, it was illegal to homebrew in the state. Mm-hmm. It didn't matter what volume you were making, or what ABV you were making. It was just illegal. So what I do now from home, um, would be a you know class C misdemeanor, which uh-huh. means you're going to pay like a five hundred dollar fine and potentially go to jail. Uh-huh. <laughs> so it was a big deal, and you know we have, as you know, we have a lot of military folks here, and there are a lot of people that would that do homebrewing or came from areas where they would do that that would stand to lose a lot if you had you know some law enforcement that were being a, a little over aggressive about maintaining that law. Yeah. So what they started to do, this organization, uh, was to legalize homebrewing in the state and also um, try to get some of the more commercial aspects of brewing um, you know liberalized is the way to describe it so loosened up if you think mm-hmm. of like the consumer end of it they're advocating for us in the home brewer cool um, yes 
And so they, they are now part, they're considered a branch of um, the Alabama Brewers Guild, which mm-hmm. is the commercial represent, uh, representative body uh, for the, the breweries that we have in the state. That's um, the bigger boys. So yeah, you can think of it as being kind of like a union, Yeah, essentially. Um, and we're part of that now. Uh, cool. We tend we deal with the consumer end and the and some to some degree the homebrew end. Mm-hmm. Uh, they deal with the legislation that is dealing with laws that deal with like the big brewers, you know, yeah, the big yeah. brewer kind of stuff. Um, cool. But one of the things that we're looking, you know, for and, and still something that you know is of interest is we we recently are kind of looking at the some of the laws that we have for homebrewing. Um, I wrote a little article on their w- uh, website about it. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's just kind of to look at this and think about where we are compared to a lot of the other states and to, and to start a dialogue, uh, see if there's things that we're interested in as homebrewers to maybe pr- pursue. Yeah. Um, yeah. So so in this article, what I what I did is I looked at the the statutes that we have dealing with homebrewing. Um, and, you know, by looking at that and looking at the different kind of statutes that you would see in our like neighboring states. So like you think Tennessee, Mississippi, Florida, Georgia. Mm-hmm. We are actually the, have the most regressive statute, That's and surprising. yeah, which is yeah. I mean, you would think Mississippi, right? But Mississippi is actually more progressive than us on this one. Yeah, um, <laughs> yeah. I would actually <laughs> suggest that everybody we're, we're go lasting. and we're read lasting through this, this article. I think that yeah. reading through this is probably the way to do it. Well, and, um, it, and, it, and it is interesting though. Some of the stuff about it, um, it's surprising. Yeah, you're uh, limited are... to, I'm reading it right now, you're limited to 15 gallons a quarter, which mm-hmm. seems like a lot for most people, but I guess for people like you that are doing many, many batches, it very quickly gets this... eaten up. Let's see, well, 15, by, you're, you're right home... now I'm probably at that capacity. Yeah. <laughs> you're home, when you, when you make bored. a batch of homebrew, by and large, yeah. you're making a five-gallon batch. Yeah. So, so it's three if batches. You, if you, yeah, so I mean or three batches. Or one batch a month. Yeah, yeah, one batch a month. That is not necessarily a lot. Yeah. Uh, no, it's not. Yeah. I'm, um, and yeah. then it looks like the second one is that, oh, this is weird. You're not allowed to leave the residence where it was produced. Mm-hmm. That's so crazy. So when, when I make beer at my home. You can't take it to my house. I can't take it to your house. Yeah. If I took it to your house, That's I have just committed a classy misdemeanor. Yeah. And then uh, if I take it to a, this is, and this is where it bothers me a lot more, is if I take that beer to a homebrew meeting. So there are a bunch of homebrew clubs in the state. Yeah, you can't do that. Lots of us. And it's typical with homebrew clubs, you bring your beer to share. Yeah. All right. And if you are bringing beer that you made to share to someone else's house and it wasn't produced in that house, that's a no no. You know, that's a class C misdemeanor. So everyone in that meeting is, is committing doing that. Meters. Yeah. Now, granted, you know, we, we're not having the cops come and bust down the doors and arrest no. us yeah, the all. Li- the the likelihood of that of something like that happening are slim to none. But just the risk yeah. of it is not okay. For Absolutely, you guys. yeah. yeah exactly. and, and that's and that's the thing. All you need is someone that's just a little overzealous and, and decides that they have an axe yeah. to grind, and that gives mm-hmm. them the ability to do that. Um, and and why and the the, the and yeah and so why have the law? Do you know what I mean? It's it's it's. Mm-hmm. The, it's, yeah, it's dumb. Yeah. Well, well I mean, it, and hopefully it gets and, changed. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. That's and that's the thing is, we're looking at that, and and you know, we're we're trying to open up a dialogue and just get get a sense of what the general population thinks um, about these laws. Well, that's and good. And whether I think or not they that... should be. I mean, it's now it even though it's a regressive law, it it's important to state that you know seven years ago it was illegal entirely. It was worse. Yeah. So it's getting yeah, better. I, I could I could make and uh, you know. A, like an ounce of beer and that would be enough for yeah. a misdemeanor you right. know i mean Let's it's, do that. yeah um but um, now you know it's a good step in the right direction so free the hops is interested in that um some of the other things that they deal with is uh we are interested in having um beer festivals mm-hmm. and you know some of the the brewery, uh, brewing festivals that we do have in People the state seem to like those. run through us um <laughs> so that you know it's it's, it's trying to advocate for the consumer is what we do well, that's cool that's really good yeah. uh well it sounds like there's a bunch of good things in the future for all of us um mm-hmm. and there's plenty of resources if, if people want to get into the stuff or are interested in it we've talked about a few things and i'll try to put links in the bottom of the video so people can get to that stuff easily uh but i just want to say thank you clark and thank you Bo. it's been a 
a great time talking to you this morning, and I hope that people learned a lot. Yeah, yeah thank thanks. you, Wyndham. It's it's fun to get to talk about beer. Yeah, yeah, of it is. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah. um, this was this was fun. All right, yeah. well, I'll talk to you guys later. All right, All right. thanks. Peace. Yeah. Bye. Peace. Bye.